on this very warm August evening. My name is Elliot Ruga. I'm the policy director of the New Jersey Highlands Coalition. The New Jersey Highlands Coalition, with its partners, the Lake Mohawk uh, Preservation Foundation, New Jersey League of Conservation Voters Education Fund, and ANJAC, the Association of New Jersey Environmental Commissions, uh, have come together to put together this really very knowledgeable panel of scientific uh, experts to talk about the phenomenon of abs and what we can do about it. Our lakes are far too vital to our livelihoods to sacrifice them to have. Whether we are lakefront property owners, whether we own a business that depends on the recreation users of the lake, or we are the recreational users, we really must make our lakes healthy again. And that responsibility is ours. What I mean by that, it's going to take the will and the cooperation of the state of New Jersey. It's going to take the will and the cooperation of the property owner, the recreational users, the municipality, the county. We are all part of the solution. I've heard officials at one lake putting the entire onus upon the state, pointing fingers at the state, and I, I believe that's a recipe failure. We all have to participate in this solution. And uh, we've had, we have uh, assembled a panel of science experts who can tell us what those solutions are. They are agnostic to the politics of and the ideology that's sort of coloring the discussion. They're going to tell you the truth. They're going to tell you what's based on, on science and fact. Now, all of the lakes that we are concerned about are unique. Lake Mohawk here has a very robust lake association that property, that lakefront property owners and near lakefront property owners are required by deed to contribute to uh, water quality um, strategies. They're lucky to have that. Lake Apacom, however, is encompasses or municipalities across two counties. That complicates things. But all those municipalities must be working together to find the solution. Jefferson does one thing, and Roxbury does another thing, and it's, it's not going to work. Um, so I'd like to uh, find out which lakes our audience members have our concerns with. You. Would you raise your hand if you're from the Lake Mohawk community? Thank you. Lake Apacom. Thank you. Greenwood Lake. Uh, Schwartzwood, uh, Schwartzwood Lake. And uh, any lakes I haven't mentioned? Lake Tamarack. Lake Tamarack. Yeah. Lake Park Symphony. Thank you. Highland uh, Lakes. Lake Stockholm. Lake Stockholm. Crystal Lake in Oakland. Crystal Lake in Oakland. Mountain Lake. Mountain Lake. Okay. Mountain Lake. Okay. Mountain Lake. Okay. Well, oh, she's Lake with the lady over here. All right. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that we have such a representation of the lakes. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the elected officials who have come here tonight, the ones that we know have signed up because they are very much a part of the solution. Is Dan Chiarello from Sparta Township. Would you raise your hand? Thank you, Dan. And uh, Ma uh, Mayor Francis from Apacon Borough, are you here? Hi, Mayor, nice to see you. Um, Alex Rubinstein, the mayor of Byron or Committeeman Scott Olson, maybe they'll come in later, or Mike Stanzillis, Mayor of Mount Arlington. Thank you for coming, Mayor. Any other elected officials who I've not acknowledged? Okay, thank you. Let me talk a little bit about what our, uh, how we're gonna um, structure tonight. 
Uh, we've asked you to write your questions, um, and that is where, how we'll find out the common questions, so they won't be asked repetitively. In between speakers, please hold up your cards, and people will come by and collect them. And after we've gone through the questions that are on cards, we will take your question. You can ask the panel to speak directly. Um, we have a survey form. If you please hand in your survey, that's very important to us. This may not be, we may do other uh, information set of sessions on HABs or other um, things that may be concerned of yours. So please hand in your survey. And if you stay to the end, put your name on the survey, hand it in. We have a raffle for $50 uh, for those who handed in the survey and have stayed to the end. That would be great. So I would like to introduce our panelist, which is um, Ed Potasnik. He is the executive director of the League of Conservation Voters. And uh, Ed, why don't you come up? Awesome, thanks, Elliot. How's everyone doing? Great. So it's, it's nice to see so many people here. And it's also unfortunate that we have to be here in a summer of crisis. And with that in mind, we're here with some really awesome and very knowledgeable panelists to provide information and also to kick off a conversation for folks to have their questions answered. So Elliot mentioned there's no cards available if you have a question. What's that? Yeah, there's some cards that are going to be passed around. So if you have a question as the evening goes on, you can jot that down. And then what we're going to do is have someone sort of aggregate them so we can quickly go through the, the pressing issues so we cover those. And then this, that second half of the questioning, we're going to also then let folks come up to the microphone and ask their questions as well. So there's kind of two parts to that open dialogue. Um, by way of background, I grew up in Morris County. Um, I'm sort of a lake boy. My lake was Lake Valhalla, um, which is about a mile from my house. I used to get on my bicycle and go there every single day. Unlike the lake we're here today, where there were motorboats, uh, Lake Valhalla was like row yourself, and only the lifeguards got a chance to, you know, get in the, the little motorboat if there was uh, an unfortunate situation. I came to Lake Apacon, which has a real special place in my heart. That's where I learned to water ski and did tons of fishing competitions. And now at New York League of Conservation Voters, uh, we work on conservation. So protecting our natural lands, making sure we have air that's clean to breathe and water that's clean to drink. There's no more important priority for this region than making sure our lakes are here for our children and their children and their children's children. And there are a lot of stressors that have happened through time that we're going to hear about. And there are a lot of another S word solutions that can be done today and tomorrow to make sure we're not in a situation like we find ourselves in right now in this summer with the numerous closures uh, across the state, and particularly with our state's largest lake, Lake Apacon. So that's, that's sort of my introduction. I'm the moderator, so that's the last you're going to hear of uh, my introduction. You came because we have excellent panelists. Uh, our first speaker is uh, Stephen Souza, who is a PhD and is CEO of Clean Waters Consulting. Dr. Souza was also a founding partner of Princeton Hydro, where he directed all of the aquatic ecology and water resources project and prepared management and guidance plans for over 300 lakes, ponds, rivers, estuaries, and reservoirs located from Florida to Massachusetts. And um, he has a great presentation for you. And again, hold your questions, write them on the card. We're going to have each speaker go and then come back for questions and we'll, we'll address those. So Dr. Souza, uh, make sure you talk loudly into this because I was in the back and it was a little tough to hear. So if it sounds booming, it's probably working. Can you guys hear me in the back okay? Oh. <laughs> Escort him out. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, we're going to talk about harmful algae blooms uh, tonight, and uh, just so there's no confusion, as Ed pointed out, I did retire from Princeton Hydro at the beginning of this year. Uh, Clean Waters Consulting is just sort of like a legal way that I can continue to work for Princeton Hydro as part of my retirement. Um, 
So we're going to get rolling. I really want to first start off by thanking our sponsors, uh, the uh, New Jersey Highlands Coalition, ANJEC, uh, full transparency. I am on the board of trustees of ANJEC, uh, the uh, League of Conservation Voters, and the uh, Lake Mohawk Preservation Foundation in the Lake Mohawk Country Club. This lake has a very, very special part of my heart. I started a lot of my work on this lake. Uh, and so this is, it's always been a pleasure to, to come up here and work on, not only work on the lake, but visit the lake and see Ernie Hofer, uh, now, you know, Jack Parker and John Stanley and the crew that works tirelessly behind the scenes, John Notero and his, and his folks. Um, but this is, uh, this is a special place for me. So let's get rolling. Uh, harmful algae blooms or harmful algal blooms, however you want to define them. Unfortunately, this has become something that we've become more and more aware of, particularly this year, maybe because some of the uh, uh, conditions that we've had with a very wet spring and extraordinarily wet July, uh, and conditions that you know, promote these types of algae blooms. What I'm going to talk about is really what are they, uh, getting a little bit of the science, uh, why did they occur, and then what can we do uh, to manage or prevent these from occurring. So first off, what's a habit? Well, harmful algae blooms, let me start off by saying this is nothing new, okay? Uh, it is perhaps a little bit new to the public and the policymakers. I'm going to date myself. I started working on lakes and reservoirs in 1975 as a master's student at Rutgers. And one of the first things I was doing was studying a blue-green algae bloom, because that's what they were called, they're not cyanobacteria blooms, at Spruce Run Reservoir. And that's been my career, trying to figure out why these things occur, how to manage them, and how to prevent them. Uh, so they are caused by cyanobacteria, and when we say we have a harmful algae bloom, I'm going to step over here so I can see this screen a little bit better. Um, when we say we have a harmful, harmful algae bloom, it's because we have an intense growth of cyanobacteria. And when those blooms uh, become very intense and the densities of those organisms become very high, uh, they release, release cyanotoxins into the water column. And that's what we're concerned about on a human you know, uh, uh, health standpoint, is the cyanotoxins. But HABs also impact the water quality of lakes, they impact the ecology of those lake ecosystems. So they have a detrimental impact on lake ecosystems so, as well as how we can recreate in those water bodies and safely drink water from reservoirs. Um, at very high concentrations, I know all of you are aware of this, you've read this in the newspapers, uh, that cyanotoxins can create health issues for humans as well as uh, uh, pets and livestock. And we'll get into a little bit of, of all of that. So I'm going to get into the science, so just bear with me a little bit. But first off, cyanobacteria, although we call them algae, they're very much different than algae. They're prokaryotes. So if you look at the cell structure of cyanobacteria, they're very simplistic. There's no organelles. But they do share one thing with phytoplankton, or what I'm going to probably refer to over the evening as the good algae. And that's that they can photosynthesize. And so that's a property that cyanobacteria share with algae. What makes them so unique? Well, I mean, these organisms have been around since probably the beginning of time. They are essentially the building blocks for a lot of the life on Earth. Um, they can assimilate atmospheric nitrogen. So that gives them, some of them, an unlimited source of nitrogen. They can pull that right out of the atmosphere. It takes a lot of energy. But they can do that. That's something that other algae cannot do. Biologically, they were very adept at assimilating and utilizing organic phosphorus. What's the big deal about that? I'll come back and, and show you what the big deal is about it. But again, good algae can't do that. Can't do it as effectively as cyanobacteria. An interesting thing with them is that they can regulate where they are in the water column. So a lot of them have gas vacuoles. So on a bright sunny day like today, rather than get scorched by all the UV, they can lower themselves into the water column and avoid those impacts. But on a cloudy day, rise themselves up so they can maximize the amount of sunlight that's available to them. 
They can also lower themselves down into the water column to get to where there's a lot of nutrients and utilize those nutrients. So unlike the good algae that are really, they're destined to sink and settle out, cyanobacteria can rise and fall and regulate where they are in the water column and use that as a means of, of actually uh, outcompeting the good algae. A lot of them do very well in very low light conditions. So there's certain species that can drop way down into the water column where a lot of nutrients will tend to accumulate right at the thermocline, that thermal break uh, that divides the warm water from the cold water and utilize all the nutrients that are there exclusive uh, to them and something that can't be done by the good algae. An interesting thing is that a lot of them are selectively rejected by filter feeders. So uh, mussels, uh, zooplankton, uh, will actually spit them out. And there's some cool little videos showing them being selectively rejected. So these filter feeders will feed on and utilize all the good algae, but selectively reject the cyanobacteria. Again, it gives them a competitive advantage. And the main thing that we're concerned about is that they produce cyanotoxins. Now, keep in mind that cyanobacteria did not evolve producing cyanotoxins to harm humans. This is a means by which they can outcompete other algae. And you see a lot of plants that do this. Desert plants produce chemicals that keep their competitors away from them so they can utilize nutrients and soils and water that are exclusive uh, to them. And cyanobacteria use cyanotoxins uh, to do just that. Uh, so that gives them a really big competitive advantage over the good algae. Now, some of those cyanotoxins may ooze out very slowly day to day, you know, from the cells. But where it becomes a really big problem is when the cells, you have a large die-off of these organisms, the cells lyse, they burst, and they release a large amount of cyanotoxins into the water column. And I'll get back to why that is an important consideration. Once those, those uh, compounds are in the water column, they're very stable. It takes a long time for them to biodegrade. So you can get a lot of these products in the water column very rapidly, and, as, and they stay in the water column for a very long period of time. So I'm gonna take off a, just a little bit of a tangent. And this is why I, I mentioned things about organic phosphorus and cyanotoxin release on a large scale. A lot of you are familiar with copper sulfate treatments, okay? And that is sort of the knee-jerk reaction to any type of algae bloom. Treat it with copper, bomb it with copper. That can actually have negative, major negative effects on water quality and our ability to properly manage cyanobacteria. It should, it can be part of your toolbox in managing your lake, but it should not be your go-to tool, okay? And the reason for that is that every time you treat a lake with copper sulfate, that copper blows up the algal cells. Good algae and cyanobacteria. So what ends up happening is you release a whole bunch of cyanotoxins very quickly, all at once, large amounts. And in addition to that, you release a lot of organic phosphorus. So now you've created an environment that is that much more hospitable to more cyanobacteria growth. So yes, you get some temporary relief, but what you'll see is that typically those blooms come back more quickly and they come back more intensely. So be careful with copper sulfate. Those of you that have worked with me in the past or have taken my class at Rutgers, you know this is something that I preach heavily. Do not rely on copper sulfate. So that's my little tangent. Here's the bad guys that we're talking about when we talk about cyanobacteria. Microcystis, planktothrix, which used to be called oscillatoria, anabena, which is now called something else. It's a tongue twister. I haven't really gotten that one down yet. Aphanosomenon, anacapsa, lingvia, and gliotrichia. The last two are pretty unique because they're benthic. They grow on the bottom. Uh, but these are the bad guys, and they're the ones that cause all of these types of problems, these funky paint spill-like types of conditions uh, on the surface of, of the lake. And yes, when you see a condition like this, or this, or this, or this, this is because you've got a major bloom, and typically the bloom is starting to break down, either because it's been treated or it's reached its lifespan. Cyanotoxins, here's, a, here's the ones, we talk a lot about cyanotoxins, 
In freshwater ecosystems, these are the three that are most commonly discussed. Microcystin, cylindrospermopsin, anatoxin, and to some extent, saxitoxins. So Limbia produces saxitoxin. But those are, the, those are the toxins that we're most concerned about in a, a, a freshwater ecosystem. Cyanotoxins, yes, we come into contact with it both dermally, by, by recreating in waters that have high concentrations of cyanotoxins, or by drinking that water. The same thing holds true for pets and for, uh, and for livestock. And even at low concentrations, you can end up with negative effects. That could be in the form of an ear or throat infection, maybe a skin rash. Uh, the problem is at the very higher concentrations, these toxins are neuro neurotoxins and they're hepatotoxins. They, they affect the central nervous system and they affect the liver. Uh, and there's some research that it's actually showing that long-standing uh, exposure, drinking a lot of this water, maybe inadvertently, that has these cyanotoxins, may be linked to various neurodegenerative diseases such as Parkinson's and even Alzheimer's. That's some research that's happening now. Okay, so that's what cyanobacteria are all about. That's what cyanotoxins are all about. Why do they occur? Well, like I said, this is nothing new. What we can do is we can thank the city of Toledo uh, for bringing this to everybody's attention. So how many of you are familiar with back in 2013 that the city of Toledo, their entire water system had to be shut down and they had to go to bottled water? How many are familiar with that? Okay, fair, fair number of you. And that was a result of a massive algae bloom in Lake Erie and the intake to the Toledo, uh, Toledo a water plant is from a canal that extends out to Lake Erie. Here's something probably you don't realize. Blooms of that intensity had occurred prior to that, and blooms of that intensity have occurred since then. The water treatment plant wasn't ready, though, at that time to deal with that intensive of a bloom. So again, these are not an uncommon occurrence, uh, but, but because of what happened in Toledo, this sort of projected and magnified the problems associated with cyanobacteria. The common denominators, this is typically what sets up a hab. We have an excessive amount of nutrient loading. And this is in particular phosphorus. I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about phosphorus. And runoff is the major source of the majority of that loading. So it comes in with stool water. About 70% of the country's waterways are impaired because of stormwater runoff. So stormwater runoff and managing stormwater is a big deal. Second thing is that if you go out and you look at these lakes that are impaired by a hab, they have relatively high concentrations of phosphorus in the water column. Third thing is that water temperatures tend to be on the warmer side, although you can have a cyanobacteria bloom in the winter. First time I came here to Lake Mohawk, it was an actual cyanobacteria bloom under the ice. I thought they had, they had dyed the ice green for, for St. Patrick's Day. Um, it was a non-toxin non non producing cyanobacteria, but nonetheless it was Coelosferium and it was, it, was, it was out there even in the middle of the winter. But typically the, those bad guys manifest when the water is warm. And then finally you need a lot of sunlight photosynthesis. So those last two bullet points that's what we have in the winter. Warm temperatures, plenty of sunlight. And that what, what ends up creating a lot of these things to occur. How am I doing with time? You're doing very well. Okay. A lot to cover. Lake eutrophication. Again, this is a term that limnologists like myself use all the time, and a lot of you are familiar with that term. What that refers to is excessive nutrient loading and an increase in productivity or the production of organic carbon. Okay, that's a lot of science, okay? But it's no different from what happens on a farm field. It's no different what happens on your lawn. And basically what it boils down to is the more nutrients you put into a lake, the more productivity. And typically in lakes, productivity is gonna be expressed as phytoplankton. And when that phytoplankton is dominated by cyanobacteria, that becomes a problem and that's when you have a hat. So lake eutrophication and the whole process of Nutrient loading, excessive nutrient loading, uh, cut to the chain. 
And phosphorus is the primary driver of eutrophication. In New Jersey, and actually the majority of the lakes and reservoirs in the US, phosphorus is the limiting nutrient or the nutrient of concern. What that means is that the more phosphorus you introduce into a lake ecosystem, the more productivity. So it's just like putting more fertilizer on your lawn or a farmer that puts more fertilizer on a, a cornfield. You get more productivity, but in this case, that productivity is expressed as phytoplankton, and then in turn, if it's expressed as cyanobacteria, you've got a problem. The thing is, although you see in lakes that are impacted by HABs, high phosphorus concentration, it doesn't take that much. We're really talking about 40 parts per billion, 0.04 milligrams per liter. Anybody know what the state standard for phosphorus is in lakes and reservoirs? It's 0.05. So you can be below the state standard, but yet have enough phosphorus to actually stimulate an algae bloom. Okay? So it doesn't take much. And this is something that my colleague at Princeton Hydro developed based on a whole bunch of studies that he's conducted, Dr. Fred Lovnow, probably a lot of you know Fred. Uh, and he works a lot on Lake Apacon and Greenwood Lake. But one pound of phosphorus can generate a thousand pounds of algae. So again, you don't need a lot of phosphorus to create these problems. A big misnomer is that eutrophic lakes are dead. And what I like to say, and probably some of you have heard me say this numerous times, is that that's not the case. They're not really dead. What they really need to do is go on a diet. They're getting too much phosphorus. And so our focus as lake managers is to try to reduce how much phosphorus is coming into a lake on a daily basis, on an annual basis. The bad news is that the majority of the lakes in New Jersey are already phosphorus rich. There's more than enough phosphorus, uh, so they're all, the majority of them are eutrophic. There's very few lakes in New Jersey that are not eutrophic. That makes the majority of the lakes in New Jersey susceptible to HABs. So this is eutrophic lake A. Not too bad, right? This is a pretty good look, looking lake. How many of you would be happy to have a lake that looks like this? You should put your hand up. I mean, that's a pretty good looking lake, okay? <laughs> this is eutrophic lake B, all right? That's not too good. Nobody wants to see this, all right? But both of those lakes are eutrophic. The difference is how much phosphorus and, and whether or not that, that lake is being actively managed. Okay. So, again, cutting to the chase, you know where I'm going with this. How to control eutrophication and limit HABs, we need to be talking about phosphorus management. So, some of you have heard me say this in the past. This is my mantra when it comes to lake management. You don't just treat the symptoms or react, uh, you just don't treat or react to the symptom. You have to identify and correct the cause. And bear with me, those of you that have taken my lake course at Rutgers, I've, I've used this analogy numerous times. Everybody in here at some point in time has had a fever. That fever could have been just the result of having the flu, could be a result of eating something bad, could be a bad, an infection, it could be a very bad, a serious illness. The fever is a symptom that there's something wrong. The mode of what you do to, to correct that illness or to address what's making you sick is going to be very much different in each one of those cases. So you can't get fooled by an algae bloom. An algae bloom is an algae bloom, but why is it happening? You have to dig deeper and figure out what is actually causing it. So if you just stop at the symptom and you react by just treating it with copper sulfate, you're not gonna be successful in your lake management activities. And just like you wouldn't build a house without a plan, you can't manage a lake without having a plan. And so this lake is actively managed. Why? There's a, there's a plan that's been put in place. That plan has been modified over the years, and it utilizes the, bull, the blueprint by which this lake's uh, water quality is managed and maintained. So you need a technically sound management plan. And that plan, the, the, the basis of that plan is gonna be identifying what is causing the lake's eutrophication and what is causing the development of a HAB. 
Lakes are really complex living organisms. There's a lot of things that are going on. There's biological, chemical, hydrologic, physical interactions. All of these things occur. You poke a lake one way, it reacts a certain way. You poke it another way, it reacts another way. If you don't understand all of those interactions, you can't manage your lake successfully. So number one, the plan's goal is gonna be collect the right data to allow you to understand all these interactions and how the lake is going to respond to certain types of management activities. And the priority element of all of that is both quantifying and identifying all the sources and quantifying how much phosphorus is associated with each source and when does that phosphorus hit my lake? Does it come in in the spring? Does it come in during the summer? So that is all very, very important. So if phosphorus is the problem, where is it coming from? Well, you've, some of you are familiar with this Pogo cartoon. The enemy is us. We love our lakes, and what do we do? We develop the watershed. As we develop the watershed, we end up putting more phosphorus into the water column as a result of land development, as a result of fertilizer use, a whole bunch of different things. And so as a result of that, we end up being our worst enemy. Um, and the important thing with that is that if we're the enemy, then we're the ones that uh, are at the root of the problem, but we're also the ones that are in charge of correcting that problem. So phosphorus inputs, they're variable, and this is why a plan is very important to figure out where it's all coming from. Is it internal? Lake Mohawk is very unique compared to many of the lakes in the state. This had a very large internal load that needed to be addressed. We won't get into the specifics of that, but believe me, it had a very large internal load. But typically what we find is that the external load is what's driving the process. Stormwater runoff, septic systems, waterfowl. Here's another little tidbit. Four geese produce as much phosphorus in one day as one septic system. Okay, four Canada geese equals one septic system. So that can be extremely detrimental. Restoration and management plans, comprehensive data back plan. It's gonna consist of reactive, reactive actions, and this would be like the things, for instance, with maybe some selective use of copper sulfate or some other type of, of uh, algaecide. Proactive preventative approaches where you're throttling down and decreasing the amount of phosphorus that's entering the lake. There's gonna be in-lake management measures, like at this lake where there's aeration that's used, there's a very sophisticated alum injection system, and then watershed management measures. Again, Mohawk has invested a considerable amount of time and money and effort doing stormwater management improvals, uh, uh, improvements around the entire watershed. Uh, and they're working on improving that as well. For the majority of the lakes that I've studied, about 80% of them, the problem is with water, the watershed, what's happening external to the lake. And so the foundation of the plan has got to be figuring out where all of this phosphorus is coming from and focusing your management efforts on stormwater. I'm a past president of the North American Lake Management Society. Uh, and how many of you feel familiar with NOMS? I hope at least some of you are. Okay, NOMS is a great uh, vehicle by which scientists get together with lake users and, and uh, lake property owners and exchange information. This year's conference is up in Burlington, Vermont in November. Uh, take the time to go up there. It's not that bad a drive uh, and, and you'll learn a lot, really. Uh, so it's not a whole bunch of eggheads getting together talking about hats. It's mostly lake community residents that get together and get educated. Same thing with New Jersey Cola. New Jersey Cola is a terrific opportunity to meet other lake uh, community members and learn about what's happening uh, about lakes, about lake management, and other issues that affect uh, lakes. So how many of you are familiar with New Jersey Cola? Good, that's a good number. And I, you know, I, I have nothing but praise for New Jersey Cola because you know, they're doing a great job. But that whole idea, a lake is a reflection of its watershed. When you look out from a lake and you see a lot of development, when you see stormwater pipes that are discharging uh, unregulated or uncontrolled, if you see you know, lawns that are extending right to the, to the water's edge, those are all problems that are resulting in uh, the, uh, the eutrophication or, or 
or uh, adding to the eutrophication problem and causing halves in some situations. So stormwater is important, and this is why we need to manage it. It directly affects the amount and timing of phosphorus loading. It indirectly affects mixing every time you have a storm event that causes the lake to turn over. In some cases, that may upwell nutrients from the bottom or cells from the bottom back up to the surface. It's a source of legacy loading, all that sediment that comes in and the phosphorus that's bound to that sediment settles to the bottom. Weeds grow from that, mad algae grows from that, and that becomes an internal source of phosphorus loading. And it indirectly even affects septics. When you have a very wet year like this year, the groundwater elevation stays high, and as a result, even in the summer, you may end up with phosphorus that's seeping out into the lake from septics. So successful lake management and HAB management has to involve systemic stormwater management with the emphasis placed on phosphorus load reduction. Next two speakers are going to talk about exclusively about stormwater management. What can be done at the residential level, what can be done on a more regional level. And there's a lot of things that we can do on both individually and then collectively as a community to manage stormwater runoff. So in summary, HABs are not a new thing. Okay. Yes, the frequency and the severity of HABs is increasing. Doesn't take too much in terms of a little bit warmer water temperatures. We don't see our lakes freeze over as, as frequently or as solid as, as, solid as it used, they used to in the past. A little bit warmer water temperatures give everything that a jump start to get growing. We know that storm events are more intense and, and they happen more frequently. And with that comes more runoff. That results in high densities of phytoplankton and unfortunately a lot of times cyanobacteria. And when those cyanobacteria densities get very high, then as a result of that we have a have and we have toxins that are released into the water column that affect us, our pets, livestock. Unfortunately, New Jersey lakes are going to be susceptible to haves. They need to be managed. They need to be actively managed. And I'll leave this with you as a takeaway again. Copper sulfate may be part of your management plan, your toolbox, but don't rely on it. What you have to rely on is mechanisms that remove and keep phosphorus away from phytoplankton and away from the cyanobacteria. So our goal is to do away with signs like this and have our lakes swimmable, fishable, and enjoyable year round. Um, Julie, are you going to be making this available to the public in any way? Because I've got a whole bunch of, of, uh, of different links that you can go to. Uh, DEP, the North American Lake Management Society, and New York State DEC have put out some very good information. I've, I've provided you with some of those links, as well as links uh, that pertaining to HABs and HAB management uh, that are available through EPA and other sources. Those of you that have pets, and I have a dog that, although it's a husky, she doesn't like to swim that much, but she does go in the water. Uh, this particular, this last one at the bottom, was written by a veterinarian for the state of Minnesota, and it's specific about the risks of harmful algal blooms on pets. So if those of you that are interested, that's a pretty good one too. So with that, I say thank you, and uh, I'll pass it on to Ed. Thank you, Dr. Sousa. So our next speaker is uh, Chris Abrupta, as a, a PhD and professional engineer. He's an extension specialist in water resources with Rutgers Cooperative Extension, my alma mater. And he's a professor with the Department of Environmental Sciences at the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences. Uh, Dr. Abrupta has a background in watershed management and water quality modeling and as well in stormwater management. Don't, don't, I talk louder, I guess, than other folks. So Elliot did this really cool thing where he turned back up the gain or volume and then I didn't turn over the mic. So I'm gonna adjust. There are note cards. Um, if you have a question, please fill them out. And there are folks coming around collecting them. So make sure you pass them in um, so we can make sure you get to all your questions. And with that, Dr. Abrupta. Okay, thank you. Uh, is everybody still awake? 
I know the <laughs> biology stuff really gets to me. I, uh, I'm a civil engineer, by the way. Um, I have an aquatic biologist who works for me. She told me I'm not allowed to speak about biology at all tonight. Uh, I, I thought it was zooplankton, but apparently it's zooplankton, so I'm not even sure I know how to say the words. Um, so I, I'm supposed to thank all these people for dragging me up here tonight. I appreciate it. Uh, I like the uh, cash bar. I, I was told it was an open bar, uh, but I guess it's okay. Um, I'm with the Cooperative Extension Service. I'm part of the comic relief for tonight. Um, the Extension Service you may know of, uh, we've been around for about 100 years. Uh, we've been working with farmers mostly to try to help them address their problems. Uh, the idea with the Rutgers Cooperative Extension Service is we extend the knowledge of university out to the state so people can solve their problems. So I came to Rutgers about 16 years ago. I used to work with Jim Cosgrove at a company called Omni Environmental. Uh, I was able to get out of there and escape, and I got to the university. Uh, so um, our mission is to identify and address community water resources issues using sustainable practical science-based solutions. Uh, like all mission statements at Rutgers, it has a lot of buzzwords in it, uh, and that's required by Rutgers. So my job actually is to run around the state and help people solve their water problems. I have a staff of eight full-time people. I do have an aquatic biologist who works for me, but I make her do proofreading instead. She's a, she's a really good writer. Uh, we try not to let her go out into the lakes, you know, because uh, she likes that too much. Um, lots of engineers who work for me, lots of students who work for me. I work very closely with the county extension offices. So uh, there's an office in every county. Uh, a few years ago, we started hiring environmental county agents. Uh, so these first five are environmental county agents. We used to have one in Morris and Somerset, but she retired and we're hoping to replace her. Uh, and we're hoping to get one eventually in Sussex and Warren County. So the idea is that you can actually go to your county office and have that person there also help you address some of your problems. That's what we're trying to, trying to do. Okay, so managing stormwater. Steve talked a lot about the issue, uh, all tied to stormwater, a lot of it's tied back to stormwater. Uh, when we think about stormwater management, we think about two things. We think about water quality, and we think about flood control. So water quality is mostly, we're putting in stormwater practices to reduce pollution. I, I'm gonna keep probably walking a little bit because I got my Fitbit on, so camera guy. <laughs> so I gotta, I gotta get my steps in or I can't go home. Uh, so um, usually we focus on smaller storms. It's like an inch and a quarter of rain over two hours, which New Jersey calls our water quality storms. So that's usually what we design these systems for. Uh, there's two types of stormwater management we're frequently using. One are these manufactured treatment devices and the other one's green infrastructure. Uh, then we have stormwater management flood control. Okay, so this is the idea is to hold the water, let that slowly so people don't flood and wash away. So this gives you a lot of your retention basins. And there's also some green infrastructure practices that, that work that way too. So water quality, this is what we're dealing with. The, uh, you know, the algae, the blue-green algae, uh, the pipes flowing into the, into the stream or into the lake, these catch basins that are filled with gunk. And then, you know, you have the lawn that's spilled right to the water's edge, the erosion that goes along with that. Uh, and all the phosphorus that washes in. So um, they have these really cool manufactured treatment devices. You know, every time we have a problem in this country, we try to invent something new and creative. Uh, so these devices are uh, basically concrete boxes. Uh, these, this is a hydrodynamic separator, also known as the swirly device. The idea of the water comes in, it swirls around, and all the pollution settles out. It's magic, it works, you know, it's beautiful. Uh, actually, it only removes about 50% of the sediment uh, the total suspended solids, and it only removes about 20 to 25 percent of the phosphorus. Okay, so Steve was talking a lot about phosphorus removal. So this probably not going to do a lot, you know. Now we have these other devices, these filter devices, which is a lot like your Brita filter you have on your faucet. And the idea is the water comes in and gets filtered. Uh, these remove about 50 percent of the phosphorus uh, from based on the, the literature that I've seen. Um, now these filters have to be replaced; they have to be cleaned. Um, there's a lot of maintenance associated with it, and both of these are very expensive. Okay, so that becomes part of the issue. So the other thing we use is green infrastructure. So green infrastructure is a cool name for stormwater management. Uh, so what we wind up doing is uh, we design stormwater systems to treat stormwater at the source. Right. So so many of you have seen these developments across the nation. So I'm going to start moving now, so you can follow me. Um, so many of you have seen these uh, these detention basins, right? Big developments. Tension basins at the bottom of the hill, and, and that, you're not supposed to manage the stormwater. So green infrastructure is something different. The idea is that we put that right at the source, and we have much smaller systems scattered throughout the development. Uh, so they capture, they filter, and then they absorb, and, and sometimes we get to reuse the stormwater. So this is something we're trying to do. So lots of different green infrastructure practices. The uh, 
Grain gardens are also known as bioretention uh, systems, uh, bioswales, downspout planters. Uh, we even have in here green roofs, which is the sexiest of all green infrastructure practices. Uh, if you ever see the presentation on Philadelphia, they uh, have a planner who clicks a button, he shows all the roofs of Philadelphia, and he clicks another button, he'll turn to green roofs. Everybody goes, ooh, ah. Except for the engineers in the room who say, well, the green roof weighs 15 to 35 pounds per square foot. And if you put a green roof on this building, it's a good chance it's going to snow and the green roof is going to be in your lap. So you have to be very careful about things like that. So, um, so we have to be very careful on which of these choose. Now, some of these actually don't just manage water quality, they also manage water quantity, right? So we can design a, a rain garden or bioretention system to manage the 100 year storm uh, that we get every one or two years. Uh, we can manage the, uh, the stuff under permeable pavement, we can hold the water. Uh, and we can naturalize detention basins, which uh, Steve's company has been doing a lot of um, before he left. I'm sure they'll do a much better job now that he's gone. Uh, but, uh, you know, so the idea is you naturalize the basin and, and it filters out more of the water, you know. So, so these are things that we do. So these are your typical stormwater detention basins. Uh, these do absolutely nothing uh, for water quality, right? The idea is the water comes in, slows down, sediment settles out. Uh, next storm comes in and washes that sediment out. There's very little infiltration because we built this with big tractors with rubber tires that compacted the ground. So it really doesn't do anything to really help with the water quality issue. Uh, then we have these things called wet ponds or retention basins, uh, which are great at attracting geese, um, which apparently I just learned today that, that four geese is equal to one septic system, which is something I learned. So, so we all can learn something today, so it's good. So the idea with this is stormwater comes in and gets stored on top of that existing water. So it's always three or four feet of water in there. Uh, and then what this is what it's supposed to look like when it works, right? What winds up happening is this captures the pollution. So the algae is growing in these retention basins instead of growing in your lake or in your stream. Uh, I get called down to Smithville in South Jersey every year by the seniors who live there. Uh, they asked me to look at their pond. Apparently he bought a house on the mermaid pond and it's green like this, and he's really mad about that because he paid extra for his house. And I get down there and open up the plans, and I say, well, you may call it the mermaid pond, but Kay Havnanian calls it retention basin number seven. And it was designed to capture all the pollution from your development so we don't pollute the wetlands in the ocean that's adjacent to your facility. So that's what it's designed to kind of do. Um, we have these underground systems, too, where we can put these pipes underground, hold water underground, and then let it out slowly and let it infiltrate. Uh, they're big enough, you could put bodies in there too if you wanted to, but hopefully you don't need to do that. But it is Jersey, so maybe, I don't know. Um, so these bioretention systems or rain gardens, so, so what's interesting here is, uh, you know, bioretention system um, is a technical name. But like I said, I'm a, I'm a civil engineer and, um, you know, I, I joined Rutgers 16 years ago and I'd gotten some funding and I, I went into a community like this and I said, listen, I've got money and I want to put a, a bioretention system in everybody's front yard. And the people say, you're not putting a bio anything in my front yard, that sounds hazardous, you know. So they came up with this name called Rain Garden. I came back about four weeks later and I said, listen, I got other money, we can give everybody a free rain garden. You get the easy lily rain garden, the easy wildflower rain garden, and the idea is you put a garden in your front yard, you take the stormwater from the road, it will slowly percolate into the ground and clean the water, and you'll have a beautiful garden for your house. And people say, wow, this is great, Rutgers is going to give us free gardens. Well, it's the same thing as a bioretention system, it's just a different name. So a lot of times we're trying to sell things and tell people about things and they just don't understand it, like cyanobacteria, right? It's kind of hard to understand what that term means, right? So, so we kind of change it up so people can accept it a little bit easier. So this is porous asphalt. Uh, the idea is that's a very coarse material and water will go right through it. There's a stone layer underneath where stone can sit in. And as water is passing through the asphalt, that stone layer is getting filtered just like it would go through a regular filter and it gets cleaner and cleaner and then it infiltrates into the ground. So you can see the cartway where cars drive is regular asphalt and the other asphalt where the parking spots are is porous. Okay, so the idea is that water goes right through, it's just a coarse material. Um, so Steve started talking about addressing the problems and I, I happened to see his slides earlier today and I, I laughed because I realized all the biology and it was gonna kill people, but you know. Um, <laughs> But you talked about two things, like the regional scale and the lake community scale, right? So, uh, and the residential scale. So, I kind of broke this down a little bit. Um, the regional scale is interesting because municipalities actually have to work together. Uh, and this is New Jersey with 565 municipalities. We said 56, but now 
we lost one. I don't know where it went. Those pallies would actually have to work together. So Lake Impact has formed as pallies. They might have to work together to come up with solutions. Uh, we start thinking about lake community scales where residents and businesses within a community or neighborhood are working together. And then we talk about individual lots, what people can do. So these become very important. So Steve talked about plans too. Uh, in New Jersey, we started doing regional stormwater management plans like 16 years ago. Uh, the state realized they didn't have the capacity to review those plans, so they asked us to turn them into watershed restoration and protection plans. And, and the idea was that you know that would give us an idea of where the sources of pollution are, uh, how to control those sources, how to prioritize those. So we started doing a lot of these plans at Rutgers. I know Princeton Hydro started doing a lot of them. Uh, these plans would take two to four years to do and it would take $200,000 to $400,000 to complete. So it was a long process. And we used to have these meetings where we'd bring people like this into a room and talk about the plan every other month. And that lasts for about 24 months before people get bored out of their mind and stop coming to the meetings. Uh, but, you know, so that's kind of the process. Um, and then you have to have this intergovernmental cooperation. So when the solutions come out, everybody has to agree that they're the right solutions. Uh, you have to have land available to implement the solutions, right? So in New Jersey, we're a lot of development already. So we really don't have a lot of land available, right? So um, the next piece is getting the water or the stormwater to that land so we can treat it and then uh, committing to maintain the facility and then finding somebody to pay for it all. And, and Jim's gonna talk about that later. He's got a big bag of money he'll land out in a bit. Um, so this is a plan that uh, was done actually by Princeton Hydro, Deal Lakes. This is one of the watershed restoration plans. So we've actually been invited to Deal Lake to do some work too. And we came up with a green infrastructure feasibility study. So these plans take us two to four months to do, and the idea is we actually identify projects that can go in immediately. So we come up with a list of projects that can go in and different watersheds within the, in the town. Uh, we've actually started grouping these together. Uh, so this is as many towns involved in this plan. Uh, usually we do this for individual towns or groups of towns. Uh, we identify projects. So here we've identified a stormwater planters or bioretention systems. We actually have a table where you do some calculations, and here we figured out that this site, you know, has, when it, when it rains on an annual basis, it releases about 0.6 pounds of phosphorus a year, which I found out today, that's about 600 pounds of algae. So if I treat this site, I can reduce my algae in my lake by 600 pounds, right? So that's pretty good, right? That's a lot, that's a lot of algae, right? So we have a site like this, and we, we show this, then we hire a landscape architect, and they render it up, and then we can visit the town and let us build it, right? So this is stormwater manager, okay? So uh, once we have these projects in the ground, then we start thinking about how do we do this on the neighborhood scale? Uh, the neighborhoods need a common goal. Common goal usually is we want to protect our pond or our lake. Uh, we always have a local champion. Uh, that's that crazy person who tries to rally everybody together and make sure things happen. Uh, you know, they're, they're totally dedicated to the issue. Uh, if you don't have a local champion, we actually have a green infrastructure champion program where we train you to be that local champion and we instill that amount of craziness in you so you know exactly how to do it. Um, and then we provide some technical expertise to those people. Um, here's an example that we did in Hillsboro. Uh, this group had a, a lake that was very, uh, a lot of algae in it, uh, a little pond. Uh, so the town had a couple meetings, we made some presentations. We offered free rain garden designs to, to the community around the lake and then we helped install the rain gardens and it really kind of took off. So this is a lake, you can see the pond on top and you see how green it is. That's not Photoshop, that's what it really looks like on Google Earth. Um, and then you can see these are the five houses that we actually put rain gardens in. As a result of this, what wound up happening is um, we wound up putting a rain garden here alongside the road to take road runoff and then we started replanting this whole buffer along the pond to reduce the amount of geese that were there. So, so these five rain gardens led into a bigger project, so it became really nice. Um, we do residential programs too, because we believe that people should take personal responsibility for what's going on. So, um, so we do have a, a rain garden rebate program, that neighborhood rain garden program I just talked about. We also do rain barrel programs at Rutgers. Um, so three minutes, wow, so Steve must use all my time. Uh, anyway, so, um, so the Rain Garden Rebate Program is really interesting. We're doing this all over New Jersey now. Um, I give a 45 minute educational session. Uh, people leave laughing, their bellies hurt, and they go home, they wanna build a rain garden, they get excited about it. So a week later, they come back, they sign up for a 30 minute block, they meet with an engineer and a landscape architect, and we work with them to specifically design a rain garden for their property. At the end of the night, they leave with a plan. If they build a rain garden, we give them a Visa gift card for $3 per square foot. 
So if they build a 150 square foot rain garden, they'll get a Visa gift card for $450. Now obviously you can only use that at the Rutgers bookstore, but no, it's just, <laughs> just kidding. Um, and then we actually help people build these gardens too. We have a lot of seniors who want to do this work. It's kind of hard digging. So we'll send our students out to help out. So this is an example of the design on the left and the garden on the right. So you can see some of these projects that were built by homeowners, you know, you can see the designs. And they get to take this design home with them the night of the session and go build it. This is some of my students who helped dig out the garden for this, this woman in the middle in the black. She, uh, she had a bad back, so we dug it out for her. The students learned which end of the shovel goes in the ground. They learned what a blister is. So it builds character, you know, really, really nice. And it only cost her some lemonade and pizza, so it was really good. Um, and then we do driveway, take driveway runoff, different things like this. And, and you can see some of the designs that we do. And here, we designed this to take one downspout, and this guy went crazy, started putting all his downspouts into one rain garden and made it much bigger than we originally designed. You know, so you can see these are some of the things that we wound up doing. And we can do this with communities and get people to take responsibility, and every homeowner can have a little part of saving the lake. Um, and you can see some of the things here. Uh, we actually have rain barrels where you hook the overflow rain barrel into the rain garden. So that's another, another piece of that, you know. And this is kind of one that was done um, by our landscape architect. And you can see, you wouldn't even really tell that was a rain garden. It's just like a nice landscape feature. And here's him contemplating the next rain garden he's going to build. The picture on the right is the before picture. This is the after picture. And that's kind of what we wind up doing. Okay, so this is it. I have time left. For, can I do this last slide? Be sure. Okay. So um, we can help you as a community, Rutgers can help you as a community uh, develop these watershed restoration and protection plans. Um, what's nice about those plans is once you develop those uh, and they get accepted by DEP, they're eligible for funding uh, from DEP from the 319H grant program. So there's a program DEP has and they'll give you funding to implement the actions that have been identified in the plan. I'm sure some of that money has gone up here to Lake Moho. Um, Green infrastructure feasibility studies, which is a lot of fun. We identify real projects that go on the ground, a lot of schools, a lot of churches, you know, a lot of places like that. Uh, these neighborhood rain garden programs are great, trying to get a community really excited about it. And that tends to expand beyond that community to other communities. Uh, so the rebate program is great if we can find funding to give out the rebates. A lot of times people will just come in for the design session because they have a, a drainage issue or they really want a rain garden. It's very hard to get a professional engineer and a certified landscape architect to come out and spend a half hour with you at your house. So it's a great opportunity to come in and bring pictures to your house and get some stuff designed for you. We have the Screen Infrastructure Champion Program. Uh, we had uh, nine classes that we had over the course of a few months. Uh, I see some of the champions are in here now. And uh, it was, it's a really good program. It teaches people about green infrastructure so they can get up in front of their township committee or in front of a group and talk about it intelligently uh, and actually take some action and move forward. And then we also assist with some grant writing, uh, mostly so we can get funding for ourselves. We'll write you a grant, so we'll write ourselves into it, you know, as a way to go. Uh, I'm paid for by the State University of New Jersey. The New Jersey Agriculture Experiment Station funds my salary. But we run on grants. I got eight full-time staff. I had 10 full-time students over the summer. We just got a really great grant from the Highlands Council to do some of these plans. Uh, so we're trying to get more funding and keep doing this work. But uh, that's what our program's all about. That's it. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Abrupta. Our next expert is Jim Cosgrove. He's Vice President and Principal at Kleinfelder Incorporated. He's a registered professional engineer in New Jersey with 30 years of experience in water resources management with specific expertise in water quality modeling, watershed and stormwater management and environmental impact assessment. He received his Bachelor's of Science degree in Civil Engineering from Lafayette College and a Master's of Engineering in Water Resource Systems Engineering from Cornell University. Don't forget your note cards and to pass them in. And with that, uh, Jim. Thank you. Good evening. So I'm the poor slob that has to follow two PhDs, one who's kind of sarcastic, and tell you about money. But um, the title of my talk is Funding Opportunities. Can a stormwater utility be a solution? Stormwater utilities talk about raising eyebrows. It's a very politically charged um, issue right now. And I'm going to try to shed a lot of light on that. I'm hopefully not going to get into any politics, but you can make the decision as to, to whether you think a stormwater utility uh, could be useful to you. But first, 
I think we have to, I mean, I think it's pretty obvious to most of you, but I don't think it's obvious to the average person in New Jersey. We have to make, put a bigger focus on stormwater management. Think about how we manage all our other utilities, things like our wastewater systems, our drinking water systems, electricity, national, natural gas, roads and bridges, telecommunications. We have actual utilities focused on managing those things, but we don't have that for stormwater. In, in, in our history, what we typically did is buried our stormwater management infrastructure and hoped it worked. And hopefully, you know, it, it, the pipes would continue to work and we'd get water as quickly as we could from the point at which it was generated in, uh, to, uh, to the local stream or, or lake. So we have to start paying more attention to stormwater. Now, there are a lot of options to fund stormwater management. Um, there are DEP funding sources. Some of you may have heard of 319H grants. Those are great, but they're never going to provide enough money to, to fund the kinds of things uh, that you folks may want to do on your lakes. This New Jersey Water Bank used to be the Environmental Infrastructure Trust Fund. That's a great program, but it's typically a loan, a very low interest loan, rather than uh, a grant. So you gotta pay that money back. Sometimes you can get it even at zero interest, but you still have to pay the principal back. The way we pay for most of our stormwater management right now is through municipal taxes. Um, right now, a municipality has to deal with their stormwater management. They have a municipal separate storm, uh, storm sewer system permit, and they're required to do certain things. The way that's being funded right now is through municipal taxes. They, that may not be the most efficient way of dealing with stormwater management. Also, charitable foundation grants. Um, some of you may have applied for grants over the years. Um, you know, there's, there's great things being done with, with foundation grants, but again, not going to be enough money to do the kinds of things that we have to do. Finally, there's the stormwater utility, which I'm going to go into a little bit uh, more here. That is an option to provide a funding source for uh, stormwater map. How's that? Okay. What's the problem? The problem is the way we deal with most thing, most stormwater now is at the municipal level. But water doesn't follow municipal boundaries. You know, so dealing with stormwater at a, at a municipal level is usually an inefficient way of doing it. It's much more efficient to look at a regional solution. And Chris and, and Steve both mentioned uh, this issue. The advantages of a regional approach is you provide more, it's much more cost effective typically. You eliminate duplication of efforts. You maximize opportunities for grants and loans. You streamline regulatory requirements. And usually it results in larger improvements that are more measurable. Well, how do you implement a regional approach? You have to have leadership. Now, I think Chris re re referred to a watershed champion as a crazy person. I might have misunderstood him, but that's not, I would think of him as a champion. Somebody who's really passionate about the watershed, who's gonna go out on a limb and fight for that watershed. You really need that on a regional solution. You need investment. You have to be willing to spend money to get things started. It's not just the money to, to make the improvement, it's the money to figure out what the best improvements are. Uh, planning, you need to develop a plan. Steve mentioned this. You have to have a plan, particularly with, with the lakes, because otherwise you're likely going to fail. OK, so how could a stormwater utility help the regional type of approach? Well, a stormwater utility can cross municipal boundaries. That's a good thing. It can provide incentive for property owners uh, who want to reduce or treat runoff. One of the big issues with a stormwater utility com compared to 
uh, doing this at the municipal level being funded through municipal taxes is that it's not just based on property values, it's based on the stormwater that you're generating. So it's more directly, the, 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 pr the price you pay is gonna be more directly related to the stormwater you generate. And you can reduce the price you pay by doing stormwater management. I'll show you some examples of that. Um, and it avoids the stormwater costs being embedded in other taxes and fees. So right now, you, know, you may get a single bill that's property taxes, may have your sewer bill on it. In some municipalities, it even has water on it. Okay, so stormwater utilities is something we didn't talk about very much in New Jersey in the past. Why is that? Because they weren't permitted. Back in March 2019, um, the governor signed legislation called the Clean Stormwater and Flood Reduction Act. That gave municipalities, counties, and certain uh, authorities the ability to form stormwater utilities. Until that was signed, it was not legal in New Jersey to have a stormwater utility. Um, it recognized uh, problems affecting residents uh, due to inadequate stormwater uh, infrastructure management talked about health and safety issues, economic well-being, quality of life. It recognized that stormwater infrastructure in New Jersey lacked a dedicated source of funding for upgrades and allowed for a fee assessment based on, and this is important, a fair equitable approximation of proportionate contribution of stormwater management, of uh, stormwater runoff. So the fee has to be related to the amount of stormwater that's being generated. So let's talk about some myths versus facts. I'm sure all of you have heard about the rain tax. That is the buzzword that gets thrown around to sort of bash stormwater utilities. It's just another tax. It's just another way to hammer the people of New Jersey and get more taxes out of them. The way I look at it is we're going to pay for this one way or the other. So we have to figure out what the most efficient way of doing that is. The stormwater utility generates a fee, not a tax. And the reason there's a difference is because the fee is provided in exchange for services received. And those, the fee is in proportion to the services that are re, uh, received. Also, another big difference, as I mentioned before, is that you can reduce the fee by doing certain things, if it's at a residential level on a, on a home's lot, or you know, a corporate campus, or even a public uh, open space. Here's another fee, an another uh, myth versus fact, which is the stormwater utility will just create another bureaucracy. It could. There's no question about it. It could create another bureaucracy. However, if you're smart about it, maybe there's an existing uh, uh, municipality, a public works that's very active in a municipality that could handle it without having a separate department dealing with it. Or maybe there's a, a utility authority that's already a, a regional utility authority for multiple municipalities that would be interested in taking over stormwater as well. I have some sewage authority clients that are actually interested in looking at this because the way they look at it is if we can find a way to address the non-point sources better, maybe they won't get so much pressure to reduce their sources. So from a very selfish perspective, they have a reason uh, to consider it. Um, and regionalization, I just, I know I've said it before, but it really is a great way to save money and lead to more successful projects. So I think this is a great illustration of where we are now and how unfair it can be. So look at the picture on the left, single family home, relatively compact home on a relatively small lot. That homeowner right now is paying for all the stormwater management in that municipality. 
It's really all the homeowners and, and certain commercial spaces that are taxable that are paying for stormwater management. But compare that to the picture on the right, which is a local school that is huge parking lots that's generating hundreds of times more stormwater than the home is and paying absolutely nothing for stormwater management because schools are exempt from municipal taxes. So that's just an illustration of how the stormwater utility could be used to solve that problem because a utility can bill all uh, people that generate stormwater. Now maybe a school isn't the best example because that's going to end up in the municipal tax bill anyway, but churches, uh, universities, Princeton, Princeton, the municipality of Princeton is a great example. A huge percentage of land in Princeton is owned by the university. Well, Princeton University is not paying taxes on most of that land, so they're not paying for the stormwater management. Okay, so how does a stormwater utility work? I thought it would, be, it would be good for you to have a sense of how it works. So you have to form the utility, you have to officially form the utility. And as I mentioned before, it doesn't have to be a new group. It could be a, an existing uh, municipality or county or association. Um, you assess fees. Those fees, you have to determine how much money you need to spend. You have to develop a budget and then establish a fee. Uh, and I'll show you in a minute how that fee is, is assessed in some places. Um, you want to promote st uh, green stormwater uh, BMPs, and you have to provide credits uh, for impact reduction. So if somebody bills a, a stormwater treatment device, they would get a credit uh, off their stormwater utility fee. And then the funds that are collected as part of the utility would be reinvested in studies, design, um, uh, engineering consulting, and then finally the actual construction of the solutions. Uh, and and the, the money can go towards maintaining stormwater infrastructure, it can go towards repairing it, or it can go towards constructing new uh, stormwater infrastructure. Now, New Jersey is not new I mean, stormwater utilities is not a new concept at all. It is in New Jersey, but not across the US. There are uh, nearly 1,700 stormwater utilities across the US right now. Um, and th of those utilities, the typical annual fee for a stormwater utility customer on a residential level is about $50 a home, just to give you a sense of what national, nationally uh, the, the numbers are like. And that may not be enough for some of the problems you folks face, uh, but that is the national average. Let me give you an example. Minnesota. Minnesota is known for a lot of lakes, that's for sure. The city of Medina, Minnesota was formed, in, uh, the, the utility was formed in 2008. It was formed to implement activities to address water quality impairments in a bunch of lakes in a certain region. Um, they had a stormwater MS4 permit in that region that had certain requirements. They were, they were in Minnesota, the stormwater MS4 permits are much more difficult to uh, achieve than they are here. So there were actual requirements for certain stormwater upgrades. This was their way of paying for those upgrades. They more equitably distributed the charges for stormwater improvement, improvements to property owners uh, than, than when they were doing it with uh, general taxes. And also they started assessing non-paying uh, entities like uh, schools and churches. How did they calculate the fee? In, in Medina, they based it on residential equivalency factors. They basically created all land to residential equivalents. And so a single family home is one REF. A multifamily residential, they somehow determined was 5.3 REFs per acre. Um, undeveloped land was 0.1 REF per acre. 
So you can see that they tried to simplify it. They didn't want to be calculating the exact amount of stormwater runoff on every acre of land. So they came up with this matrix that you could use that was relatively simple. Their annual uh, cost per REF was $30.31. Down in Butler, uh, Butner, North Carolina, they had a similar lake issue. Uh, here they had a regional effort between two different counties and three different municipalities that were outside of those two counties. And they had a nutrient impairment to Falls Lake, uh, a local lake, and they wanted to address uh, new and existing development, agriculture, sewer, and failing septic systems. Uh, they provided the same services that were pr previously provided by the individual municipalities, but they saved a lot of money by banding together and doing it with one entity. It was much more economical. Uh, and it ended up resulting in better environmental health as well. Now here they did the, the fee a little bit differently. They had a fixed charge that everyone had to pay of $12. And then based on the gross area, they had another adding fee. So if you, for example, were a homeowner on a one acre lot, you paid the $12 fee, plus you paid another $25 for having zero to two acres. And then you have an impervious charge. Single family home got hit with a $30 impervious charge. So if again, a single family home would pay a total of $67 a year. Um, and then other people that were not on single family uh, de in de developments were paying uh, $30 per 3,100 square feet of land. So it just gives you a sense here, you know, $67 for, for the average homeowner. So that's what two people have done. I'm gonna stop there. You've heard a lot of talking tonight and this thing is buzzing your, your ears. Up. Um, but uh, we're to the point where we can take some questions and have some discussion on the panel. So I'll turn it back over to Ed. As well. So one question that's been talked about, I think, a lot, just you know, as you've been reading media, Works is a, um, a, a, a generous term. <laughs> um, so does the state regulate the amount of phosphorus in fertilizers, or should towns be doing this? Oh, I'm the problem? I wasn't going to say that, but. That's not the first time I heard it. Um, so does the state regulate the amount of phosphorus in fertilizers, or should towns do this through local ordinances? Um, I'm gonna do three at a time then, if they're so easy for these guys. I like to play a game where we have political people, like elected officials, and the audience ask questions, I call it stump the politician. So I wanna say this is stump the expert. Other than reducing nutrient loading, what should lake managers do to reduce these algae blooms, um, specific chemical treatments? Um, and then maybe one more, um, is it necessary to treat roof downspouts? So the three we can remember are, does this, should we do something locally about phosphorus? And then um, I'm trying to hold things at the same time. What else should we do besides the uh, uh, copper and then rain spouts? All right, I'll try to tackle the uh, fertilizer one because that's an easy one. Uh, probably a lot of you may not be, uh, may not know this, but in 2012, the state passed a regulation that prohibits the over-counter sale of lawn fertilizer containing phosphorus, which means if you go to Lowe's or if you go to Home Depot or wherever else and you buy a bag of fertilizer, it is not going to have any phosphorus in it, okay? That's number one. But a, landscape, a landscaper can get a permit to apply phosphorus-based fertilizer and they have to go through a training with DEP and have a certificate. Uh, Lake Mohawk was one of the first communities along with Lake Apcon to actually champion non-phosphorus fertilizer within the community. That was done originally 
on a, uh, you know, it's the right thing to do, let's go out and do it. But right now, again, there's a regulation that prohibits that. If you do have a lawn service, if you live on a lake, or within 300 feet of a lake or a stream that feeds a lake, make sure your landscape contractor is not using any phosphorus. Remember, one pound equals a thousand pounds of algae. So that's an easy one. Okay, so the thing that Steve kind of talked about with the phosphorus, the reason we banned phosphorus was because there was enough phosphorus in the soil in New Jersey, so we didn't need to add more. So every time sediment washes off your lawn, it still carries phosphorus to the waterways. Okay, so, so that's something to kind of think about. So this question I got was, um, oh wait, I have to put these on. So sorry, sorry. So, oh, is it necessary to treat roof runoff? Okay, so phosphorus does settle out of the atmosphere on hard surfaces, so it is uh, important to also treat roof runoff. Now, there's not as much phosphorus coming off the roof as there is coming off other surfaces, but um, it certainly helps. And we start talking about one pound of phosphorus creating a, a thousand pounds of algae, uh, every little bit helps. It's very easy to treat roof runoff um, with simply with landscaping features that you can collect that water and, and, and use that water into rain gardens and get it into the ground. So. But just before you do that, the next question is about chemical treatment. As I was reviewing these, a bunch of other sources are in the phosphorus area. So some folks, um, you know, had talked about, you know, Dr. Susan mentioned the lawns are contributing. Does it make sense that the lawns don't actually have to have fertilizer on them to be contributing? It means people didn't just fertilize before a rainstorm, that on their own, natural lands have phosphorus. And there's like three questions about that. Um, basically, can we stop using fertilizer? Um, does an untreated natural lawn produce phosphorus? And there was a, a sort of criticism of, of blaming lawn owners for the problem. So, you want to add anything on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, lawn owners are sort of like the easy target, but every single land use, a forest, Farmland, a parking lot generates phosphorus. And how much is a function of a variety of things, but it's a source of phosphorus. So as you know, as, as Chris pointed out, yeah, you know, stormwater falling on your lawn, even if it's not fertilized, is going to liberate some of that phosphorus that's in the soil. That phosphorus then ends up in the lake. So there's a whole bunch of things that are happening. They're just not associated with lawn fertilizer or fertilizing lawns that is affecting phosphorus loading. And that's why when like we develop plans, we try to figure out where is all this coming from? How do we prioritize these sources and how do we do our best to reduce that loading? Because we know from every single land use, there's a certain amount of phosphorus that's being liberated. And that's where the stormwater management comes into play. Whether you're talking about a parking lot, or a rooftop, a driveway, there is a mechanism in place, or can be in place, to intercept and treat that runoff and reduce the amount of phosphorus that's heading into your lake. So yeah, you know, lawns may be the easy target, but when you look at the whole picture, this phosphorus coming from all kinds of land uses, and all of those land uses need to be managed, and that's why stormwater management is so important. Okay, so the question here is, other than reducing nutrient loading, what, uh, what sort of, uh, uh, what should lake managers do to reduce the algae blooms? Uh, specific chemical treatments. You need to be really careful. Like I said, you know, algicide applications can be part of your toolbox, but you need to really understand, it's horrible, I'm trying to get away from these things. Uh, you know why those you know why those blooms are happening in the first place, and try to minimize the use of any type of treatment because it, it, in the long run you're shooting yourself in the foot. So I can't stand up here and say exclusively don't treat your lake. Okay, the thing is you need to understand when those blooms are starting to develop. You want to treat them early or try to really like like my major as you you know my major. Uh, recommendation that I've been pushing all night is reduce the amount of phosphorus. Less fluid, less algae, 
And so that's the, that is the key. And you know, so, to, you know, to successful lake management. But, you know, if you're gonna treat, treat early before you have a bloom that develops and becomes, you know, at, at a really high density, and make sure that you're using products that are very effective. There's alternatives to copper sulfate like Green Clean, which is the percarbonate based uh, product that works like some, some, somewhat like peroxide that oxidizes the algae and can oxidize, actually can oxidize cyanotoxins as well. So there's options out there. There's a lot of other techniques, but you need to understand your lake. You need to know your lake. Why is this have occurring? Why is this phytoplankton bloom occurring? And then take the appropriate action. So I can't say, you know, exclusively don't treat, but I can say treat cautiously. Great. Thank you again for taking time to fill out the cards because there's actually a number of questions that are similar. Um, so why do lakes without major development around them suffer from HABs similar to ones that have a lot of development? Um, if HABs are caused from uh, phosphorus from the runoff of overdevelopment, then why is Spruce Run seeing a HAB? Um, why are some lakes like Lake Mohawk doing better this year or doing okay? and others aren't. So this is like other bodies of water experiencing similar or different things with different circumstances, right? So you sort of see the theme of those questions. I, I think we touched on a little bit, but maybe more pointed, um, particularly with Lake Mohawk, I think, and Spruce Run. So uh, Spruce Run's interesting. Um, it's, a, it's a reservoir and they actually pump water from Spruce Run around the valley. Um, but Spruce Run is surrounded by agriculture. Right, so there's a ton of phosphorus associated with agriculture runoff. So um, it doesn't have to be direct stormwater runoff to the lake. It could be runoff to the tributaries that feed the lake. Okay, so you have to look at the whole system. That's why we think about watershed management plans, uh, and that's that's a big piece of it. Um, was there something else in there? Is that, is that pretty much it? Okay, no. The next one I think we'll be able to address as well. Um, so this question is about if halves are in a lake lakes often drain to rivers. Is there a threat to anyone downstream from lakes? Um, and there are two questions on that. So, so usually rivers are flowing, so you have that aeration, so, you, so it breaks up the algae quite a bit. Uh, one treatment that Steve was, was talking about was chemical treatment, but also we aerate a lot, and that, that helps out a lot too with the algae problem. So, so flowing water tends not to have uh, you know, a lot of problems with the algae because it is flowing. Also, the stream also has an advantage because there's a lot of shading that's associated with it. So by the time it leaves the lake, it's being broken up and, and that's being dis dissipated. So usually it's not too much of a problem downstream uh, until it gets to the Barnegat Bay. And then we spend all our tax dollars fixing the Barnegat Bay because uh, that's crucially important in New Jersey. So. <laughs> um, so I think we talked about solutions, um, but I think the, we ended talking about all of these solutions come at a cost and um, you know where does that money come from and how much of it is the burden of the local community how much of it is the burden of folks that live outside that community or the federal government and how does that interconnect and so there's a number of folks um, that that ask questions in this area um, which i'm thinking after you leave here will help drive solutions so you know which grants are available to private community lakes um, that are not um, in a, under a municipality's jurisdiction. And uh, similarly, uh, based on your solution options, which ones can be subsidized by the state or federal grants? Well, as I mentioned, this is a tough issue because there's much more work to be done than there's funding available to do. That's a very, very large issue. I'm sure you folks are really frustrated by that. So I mentioned there are foundation grants that the Lake Association can sometimes get, um, but you know there are people that are scouring those all the time. There's lots of competition for them also often. Uh, use your local watershed association groups, uh, groups like ANJAC. I mean, talk to people like that to help key you in as to opportunities that may be out there. Uh, but there is no magic bullet here. There is a tremendous amount of funding. You, you talk about people talk, uh, 
using the term unfunded mandates. Well, you know, we have a situation here where we've got a hell of a mandate and it's only going to get worse. You folks are concerned because of something you can see and feel and touch and you're experiencing in your everyday life. That actually is easier to get people passionate about than when you have stormwater management situations in other places where you can't really see them as much, where they're happening much less often. Um, so this is a really tough issue and there is not enough funding. Um, so you know, it, it's something that is, is a lot of work to be, to be done here. And one of the things I, I think I forgot to mention is that DEP, New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection, has been charged with figuring out this whole stormwater utility thing. And one of the things they're going to have to figure out is funding. So keep your ears open because you're going to be hearing a lot about this uh, in the future. And, and one thing you want to keep in mind is even if you hate the idea of a stormwater utility, and you're thinking over my dead body when I have a stormwater utility, learn from the people that have done it because it's a group of people who have banded together who've accomplished something. Maybe the mechanism that they use to accomplish it doesn't work for you. That's fine. But learn with some of the things that they've learned because there are 1,700 groups out there that have studied stormwater management. Many of them are on lakes and many of them have started to solve their problems. So look at what they've done. Again, maybe it's not a utility you want to form to do it, but you might learn from how they handled it using a regional solution. You know, and one of the things with the stormwater utility what am I doing wrong exactly? Um, oh, closer? Okay. One of the things with a stormwater utility that is important to emphasize is the polluter, the person that's creating the phosphorus problem, um, is the one that pays. And there's, you know, deductions that you can get in credits for re reductions in implementing things like rain gardens and rain barrels. So it follows, you know, how much concrete pavement you have, how much you're contributing to the demise, in this case, of, of our lakes. One question here on this is, um, in towns where stormwater fees were started, how much did it increase property taxes? My guess would be actually lower property taxes, but I'm... Well, theoretically, if you suddenly uh, start a utility, whatever the utility fee uh, is initially should be, the, the taxes should be reduced, but what normally happens is it's at a time where somebody is realizing they have to spend much more money on stormwater management than they ever did before. So it's likely you're not, I mean, when do you see your tag, your property taxes reduced? Doesn't happen too much. But the kinds of dollars we're seeing in stormwater utilities are not great uh, per, per household. Um, and then this question is, is sort of novel. Are there possibilities of getting a ballot initiative a ballot initiative on the 2019-2020 ballot to cover the cost of solutions. Um, so, New Jersey League of Conservation. Yeah, maybe it's a game issue. I was following instructions. I guess. I'm sorry for your ears. Um, so, in 2014, we were involved with New Jersey League of Conservation voters and a number of environmental parties with the. Uh, open space dedication from the corporate business tax, and then again in 2017, the constitutional amendment that dedicated uh, natural resource damage money from polluters back to the communities that were harmed. Um, so I think I can speak to this. It's a novel idea, I'm not sure who asked it, but I think it's really tough to think the appetite of voters uh, to chip in, to bond, or dedicate an existing source of revenue to stormwater management. Just given history in New Jersey, we haven't seen that happen. New Jersey is the most densely populated state, and you know we continue to create more stormwater that goes unabated and polluted into our waterways. And it's you're all here for, I don't know, a couple hours. You're pretty educated on this stuff. You probably still have questions. Putting a question like that to the ballot is really hard and educating the public is going to be really hard. So I'm not, I think it's possible. I don't think it's probable. 
it's really going to be left up to other sources of revenue, very likely. It's hard to imagine explaining to voters this complicated situation and then voting yes. How will we know whatever uh, opponents to it see it as? And you know, the stormwater utility legislation was supported by both Republicans and Democrats in the New Jersey legislature. So it's a bipartisan solution in many states, including Utah and Florida, um, and, and, and working in a lot of those places. So then the next pile of questions we have, yeah, and then, and then we'll go to the next pile, which is around solutions. And then I think we can probably open it up quickly for some public questions. Yeah. Just, one thing I just wanted to add to what Ed was talking about, and I think you know what both Chris and Jim touched upon is that we have the ability to implement some of these solutions ourselves. I mean, I live on a half acre lot. I don't live by a lake. I have four rain gardens on my property, and I have a rain barrel. Okay, so you know, I take the initiative myself. First off, I hate to mow my lawn, so by having all these rain gardens, I've got less lawn that I have to mow. But at the same time, I'm reducing the amount of runoff that's coming off of my property. It doesn't take that much effort to create a lakefront buffer, stop that lawn from going right to the water's edge. It's a different strategy, it's a different mindset in terms of what our lands are supposed to look like. But rain gardens, rain barrels, these are all small scale improvements. Think about it though. Lakes did not get impacted, they did not become eutrophic overnight. How did they become eutrophic? It's small incremental additions of phosphorus over time. And we can reverse it by doing the same. Yes, it takes effort, it takes time, but we have the ability to control our own destinies. We won't have to wait for these big regional projects. We can start doing this on an individual scale. And if you can reduce the amount of runoff from your property, if you can manage the one year event on your property, it doesn't sound like a lot, but that's 3.75 inches of rain, okay? Over a 24 hour period, you maintain all of that volume on your property. Comes out, you know, for a half acre lot, that might be maybe about 15,000 gallons. You're reducing the amount of pollutants that are running off of your property by about 95% over the entire year. That's the one year event. Half year event, you know, maybe an inch and a half of rain. That's a big deal. So you can do this yourself. You don't need to you know, rely on all these regional solutions. This is where these small scale management techniques are very well suited for lake communities. Great, so in the solutions category, we have uh, people think lakefront properties are, you know, the, the first line of cause. So how can we convince people up the mountain that they have to be, over it says, um, responsible for stormwater management as well? So like, what about our neighbors, right? Water doesn't know political boundaries or lot lines. Um, this was interesting as well. So how do we control the quality of water in the streams entering into our lakes, which is sort of an upstream, uh, up the mountain type of thing? Um, let's take those two together because they're very related and we'll go to the next, uh, next one. I'll begin and then I'll pass the mic down. But when we, do a water, when we do a lake management plan, the first thing we do is figure out what's the rim of my funnel? Where is that funnel that directs all the water down into the lake? What is the boundaries of that? And then we start to identify all of the sources. Some of it could be forested land that discharges into a stream. Some of it could be upland development that's not right close to the lake. But anything within the rim of that funnel is generating nutrients and pollutants that end up in the lake. So stormwater management is is going to have to be a, a, uh, implemented on that on a, on a scale that affects that entire contributing watershed. So yeah, the lakefront property owners may get like a bad rap, but it's not just them; it's everybody in the watershed. And this is where the management plans come into play. It helps identify sources. It helps distribute. Let's call it the you know, the, uh, the problem, and it helps get people to understand that everybody needs to pitch in you know, for, uh, to uh, achieve the solution. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting because uh, we often try to figure out what everybody's contribution is, you know, so we look at it and say, okay, even though you're, you're a block or two blocks away from the, the actual lake, here's your contribution to the pollution in the lake. And 
Um, we spend a lot of time at Rutgers Co-op Extension trying to educate people about this. And I think one advantage of being with Extension is that uh, we can't be an advocate for anything other than good science. So uh, we'll tell people, you know, here's the advantages and disadvantages. So the advantages of a rain garden could be great. It could be managing stormwater. It could look beautiful. The disadvantages, it's a garden. You have to take care of it, you have to weed it, right? So we'll tell you the whole story. You know, I used to be a consultant, and I used, only used to tell you the good stuff when I was a consultant, and I would never take, take uh, responsibility for anything bad that happened. But now, now I'm at the university, I'll tell you the good and the bad. So a lot of times people invite us in, and, and we'll lay it out for you. And what we find is 15% of the people are willing to adopt, they're early adopters. They'll jump on board, they'll do it because they want to do it, because they think it's the right thing. 15% of the people will never adopt. These are the people who, when they're on fire, you tell them they're on fire and they won't put it out. You know? So, I mean, so, but there's that 70% in the middle. You know, once we get the early adopters and they can start helping us get that 70% in the middle. Um, a lot of times we're doing these rain barrel workshops and someone will build a rain barrel at this workshop, they'll take it home, they'll install it, and they become like the rain barrel Nazi. They watch your neighbor walk to the mailbox, and they chase them in the mailbox, they say, how come you don't have a rain barrel? You should have a rain barrel. And they start promoting these ideas. Uh, you build a rain barrel, you become a green infrastructure champion. Next thing you know, you're at, you're at the town meeting saying, how come we don't have a rain barrel at the library? How come we don't have a rain barrel at the schools? So this is what we're trying to instill in people, is kind of thinking about what the solutions are, how easy they are, and, and get them to, to, to ask their community to, to jump in and, and join in. Uh, we mostly work a lot with students in schools and kids. Um, you know, I, I, uh, my old man learned about recycling. I came home one day from, from middle school and he was mowing the lawn and he had his Miller beer can and he threw it in the garbage. And I said, Dad, we, we should recycle. You should throw it in the garbage. So whether you believe in recycling or not, he put a garbage can next to the shed and he threw all his empties into that garbage can. Now, once my mom realized how much she drank, he got in big trouble. But, <laughs> but that's how the old man learned about recycling. Now, whether he did it because he believed in recycling or he did it because a kid got him to do it, you know, he did it. And, and now, like, I'll go to a meeting and I'll have a work with it. If not, I'll throw it in the backseat of my truck. And now my truck is filled with backseats and empty bottles. But, you know, so this is what we've been trained to do. So the idea is how do we train people to begin thinking about taking that responsibility? You know, when I, when I bought a house, the, the guy who sold me the house gave me this whole list. He said, you know, hey, when the furnace, you have a problem with the furnace, here's who you call. You know, here's the guy who did the roof, you know. And so he gave me all the information on the house, on the fireplace, everything. You know, I'd like it to be when, when I sell my house, I could hand that list down and say, oh, and by the way, here's the rain party. And here's how you take care of it. You know, you're responsible for your stormwater management. Here's what you should be doing. And that's the kind of mentality we have to get people to do. When we build rain gardens at schools, the kids go home and try to shame their parents to build the rain gardens. And if they get their parents to build the rain garden at home, they get an extra higher grade. So it's really, it's really a great way of doing it. Oh, so um, it's interesting because uh, how, how effective a rain garden is, someone asked. Well, um, a rain garden is simply a, a landscape depression. It's a, well, we try not to say depression because people start thinking about it so often and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, so it's, a, it's a shallow landscape feature. Uh, it's about three to six inches deep. So it's designed usually to handle a two-year storm, which is about 3.3 inches of rain. Okay, so 3.3 uh, inches of rain comes from your driveway, if your roof goes in a rain garden, it fills up with water, within 24 hours it sinks into the ground. Uh, so what's going into that garden, uh, it's getting completely removed from going to your lake, it's going into the groundwater, right? So it captures the two-year storm, which is 95% of the rainfall we get in New Jersey, comes in storms that are less than three inches of rain. So it captures 95% of the rain, which captures 95% of the pollution, so it removes that from going to your lake. So it's very realistic, that example I showed you before, that, that 0.6 pounds of phosphorus coming off that site, 600 pounds of algae, we can capture 95% of that in rain gardens. And it'll look beautiful, it'll enhance the property values, and it'll promote pollinator habitat, because we need pollinators, right? Because bees are in trouble. And if we don't have pollinators, we don't have food. We don't have food, we don't have people, right? So very important. So, uh, so it all kind of ties together. Awesome, great, great, thank you. So a couple of things I want to remind you of. On your chair when you came in was the survey form. We're going to take some more questions. Um, make sure you fill this out. We're going to do a raffle for $50 from my pocket to, what's the restaurant? No, they can spend it. Oh, you can take the $50 cash.
So there you go. So we have a number of note cards left, but I know some people might have questions. Raise your hand if you have an actual question you want to come to the microphone. So I think we're going to wrap up the note card section uh, after one more question. And then if you have questions, just get online here and we'll take questions from the audience. And when that wraps up, we will um, do our raffle for cash. Um, so last question. I have to pick from so many great questions. I want to thank you guys again for, for being so thoughtful and for your time tonight and to our panelists. So the Lake Apacon Foundation maintains two wetland islands in, um, I think it's Hashley Cove and, and Neighborhood of Nutrients. And so the question is, why can't we be deploying more wetland islands in all of the coves? Did you guys hear that? More wetland islands. There, it's another management technique similar to rain gardens, except you know you've got the garden sitting in the middle of the lake. It can be a, an effective means of helping to reduce phosphorus availability. Is it the be all and end all? Is it going to you know cure all the uh, problems with you know Lake Atcom or any lake? No, but it's it is part of the solution. And you know, when correctly built and designed and maintained, you know, Princeton Hydro has done a lot of these, and they've installed a number of them in a lot of different lakes. Uh, and Fred Love now has actual data. I uh, forget how many pounds of phosphorus a year for a 250 square foot, you know, island. But it is an effective part of the solution. So I would say, yeah, yeah, I would encourage more of those types of small scale solutions as part of the big picture. Solution. Awesome. So there's a lot of rumblings in this room echoes. So if you did want to have a conversation, grab your partner, step out in the hallway. Folks that are here want to hear the questions and the answers. So we just ask you to be respectful. I know it's a bunch of time and adult learners. It's the tough, toughest thing. Um, you can't hear me? Oh, in the back. Folks that are in the back, you're still in the room. That means when you talk, it's like me talking, except for you don't have the nasty little high-pitched buzz. So uh, take your conversation into the hallway. We greatly appreciate it. So uh, dessert and coffee out there. And there is dessert and coffee for your conversation. So um, hopefully that microphone's working, and we'd love to hear if it's working. Yeah. Okay. So John Kurzman, uh, Lake Pack A couple of quick questions. One is actually for the audience, or maybe the experts here. It, we did a five-foot drawdown at Lake Pack On. And we had, in some ways, a very good summer. So my first question is, we didn't have any regrowth even before the, in, in most of the lake, we didn't even have regrowth before the algae bloom. So it was, we were not sure if that caused it due to the five foot drawdown. Did other water bodies in Lake Apacon start, I mean, other water bodies in New Jersey start off with less weeds, uh, you know, which of course, if you don't have weeds, you get algae anyway, or did it start off like a normal year? for other water bodies. Great question. Again, folks in the back, your voice echoes like a megaphone. So, I try to do my best. Um, I'm, you know, I can't really speak specifically to, you know, Lake of Patcom. No, I'm talking about okay. all the other lakes. All the other lakes. I think this year has been a very, very challenging lake, like a year for lakes because we had a very, we had a very mild winter. We had so that meant the lakes didn't freeze that solidly, that solid. So productivity got started early. We had a wet spring and an extremely wet July. So there was a, a, a constant amount of loading. Now, you know, lakes do they 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 they, they call it like an equilibrium. Some lakes are weed dominated. Some lakes are phytoplankton dominated. Um, however, you know, majority of weed. Majority of weeds get their nutrients from the sediment, not from the water column. Whereas the phytoplankton, including the cyanobacteria, are getting their nutrients from the water column. So when you have an early spring, a lot of productivity that happens, you're gonna get some shading that might get, you know, cut down on the amount of weed growth that you're seeing you know, within the water body. But you know, I would say this year has been an exceptionally challenging year for algae growth. But were they heavy weed or light weed in the spring? The lakes. 
I'm right, yeah. not sure. I mean, every lake is different. It, it's really different. All right. And the other thing is, we were talking about these storm drains and everything. You know, the New Jersey fertilizer law says, you know, you can't fertilize within 25 feet of the lake. Don't forget, I mean, it, it, EPA and DEP have these programs to put the signs on your storm drains, you know, drains to lake, and yet we, we haven't changed our law in New Jersey yet to say that really it shouldn't be 25 feet from the lake, the water body, it should be 25 feet from all of these storm drains. Exactly. You know, and, that, and, that, and that's where public education comes into play. I just got a, a, an email from a lake resident that was complaining about dog walkers. They pick up, you know, but they pick up the poop, put it in a bag, and what happens? The bag gets thrown in the storm drain. So it defeats the entire purpose. That all comes down to education. You know, so it's a, it's a very good point. And then lastly, I have the EPA satellite views that I used, which showed you know, Lake Pacon in the whole state of New Jersey, it shows where all the blue-green algae is. So, you know, we don't have to fix all of our storm drains. We only have to fix the storm drains that are leaking blue-green algae or le leaking, these, leaking these nutrients. And so I actually went and looked where I saw lines coming out into the lake. I went on a jet ski and I went to follow the lines of, of the nutrients and I found the bad storm drains in Lake Pacon. There's only like six of them. So we don't have to go and, and retrofit and do the entire lake. Some of them have already been taken right. care of. And, and you're absolutely right. And that, and that is usually part of a watershed plan. Right. We identify the, you know, the dirty operators, and that's where the focus. So you don't have to you know, correct every single one of them. Okay. But you need to know where the dirty operators are and go out and, and get them. So people should use that software. And thank you. OK. And I'm just going to ask, because there's a bunch of people, if you have more than one question, just ask one and then go to the back of the line and we'll look at that way so everyone gets a chance. Go ahead. Thank you. First of all, I'd just like to thank all of you for being here. It was extremely informative and it's great to have a panel of experts. Um, I agree with my neighbor from Lake Apacon. I live at Lake Mohawk, but uh, with regard to the barrier at the lake and the runoff, I have crabgrass that I mow because it's fertilizer. However, 15 feet from my home is a drain that comes from a very gorgeous, lush golf course. Uh, and you've mentioned phosphorus, but you have made no mention of nitrogen, which is one of the major causes of an algae bloom. So we have the runoff that comes straight into the lake, and uh, the weeds are very high, and we have extensive algae blooms in our coat. I'm not looking to place any blame. It's been here a long time, but I'm looking forward to solutions. And I was wondering if you've done any work with golf courses and maybe some type of management that they could do with a, some kind of a closed system, you mentioned catch basins and things. Have you worked with golf courses and do you have some suggestions? Thank you. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on this now. Again, I'll share the mic with, uh, with Jim and Chris, but I have done a lot of work with golf courses and surprisingly, golf courses tend not to use a lot of phosphorus because it just, it, it actually helps stimulate the invasive species, the no, pollen. I, I know, but what about the nitrogen? The nitrogen, yes, yeah, you know, nitrogen loading is something that um, typically we, we don't do a lot of, simply because phosphorus is the, is the limiting nutrient. And, and so until you get your phosphorus numbers down, the, the nitrogen, you can have it there, and it's not really what is, is it's supporting the bloom, but it's not stimulating the bloom. It's the phosphorus. I'm sorry, I had one question, but it's, it's still the same yeah. question. I'm not talking about the harmful algae. I'm just talking about algae, algae in blooms general. in general, yeah. which we have. Right, right. So okay. again, you know, for whether it's, it's, you know, whether it's a diatom or it's, it's cyanobacterium, it's phosphorus that is the primary nutrient of concern. That's what more phosphorus, more algae. And so in, in freshwater systems, the focus is definitely on controlling phosphorus. And once we start getting that down, some of the same techniques that are used for phosphorus management work for nitrogen management. Now nitrogen is much more difficult to control because it, it can be in a dissolved state, it can be in a, you know, in, in a gaseous state, an atmospheric state. So it's, it's a little bit more difficult to control. But luckily, phosphorus tends to be the nutrient that needs to be wrangled in and, and reduced first. But a lot of the same measures that we use for phosphorus control work for nitrogen control as well. Okay, could you suggest a measure or something we could be going forward? 
Well, again, I, I would say that, you know, for, if, let, let's, let's go back to lawns, okay? You can use a, a lawn fertilizer that has slow release nitrogen. That way, when, when you irrigate or it rains, it won't run off as quickly, okay? Aerate your lawn. Let that water seep down in the lawn. Most lawns are contacted almost to the, to the point that they function hydraulically like concrete. They, you know, you get a lot of runoff from that. Uh, so aerate the lawn. Look at alternative lawn covers. Don't go with grass. Grass roots are about an inch deep. Look at look for you know, uh, you know plants that have deeper root systems or stop reducing the amount of lawn cover and stop using different types of rain gardens and planted, you know, planted areas to intercept runoff and keep that runoff on site. So that will reduce nutrient loading, both nitrogen and phosphorus, as well as sediment loading. So those are those are positive actions that can be taken. And I think as it relates to the golf course, that's what I'm right? you know, like, pay to drain that into the cove. So this is this is part of why you know having funds available to you know like the golf course having itself you can't just say because it's sort of grandfathered with this little system like you have to do something new they would have to do that voluntarily or through an incentive program or a grant program but if you were to create some sort of um, fee structure like a stormwater utility then they would be paying their fair share and you would de disincentivize them from polluting your storm drain because they'd have to pay for it so they might actually put in their own thing. So they can get a discount and then the money that they're paying could be used to create a system which i don't think steve you got into so much but you know like a catch basin or a rain garden or whatever else with the remaining or but onto itself right now there's nothing you could do but watch the water flow by unfortunately yes yeah. thank you yeah uh home what's the lake um, I guess my question is, most of the homes around the lake are on small parcels. When I was younger, we dealt with all of our yard waste, you know, leaves, branches and stuff, by burning. Now that's considered bad because it puts particulates in this air and into the uh, atmosphere. Uh, on my little, you know, less than a half acre lot, that means my, my compost heap is not that far from the lake. Every time we have one of these torrential rains where we get, you know, two, three inches in a day or so, I wonder how much of the, you know, biomatter that I've been either putting in my compost heap or even at this point, mow your lawn. If I, if I allow it to mulch into the lawn, it's now sitting on the surface. We get one of these heavy rains, how much of that washes back into the lake? Would there be some benefit in coming up with some, you know, a compost site, you know, a mile away from the lake? even a thousand feet away from the lake where it will float you know more slowly back into the water <laughs> so uh you know, that's a great idea so i mean this is about getting communities to come together and, and asking the town can we have a compost site off site and then getting homeowners to, to, and shaming them to, to be able to take their material to that compost sure. site uh you know one thing that we had talked about was uh, fertilizer and lawns and you know, when you cut the glass, grass clippings and you leave them there, there's also phosphorus in those grass clippings, right? So that's eventually getting into the lake too. So, so even, you know, sometimes picking that stuff up and, and taking it away when it's really heavy and composting is a great idea. So, so that's something you should be talking to your town about and it's a simple solution. The town probably it's a site where you can do this. It's just allowing you guys access to go and take a garbage can and dump it there, you know, once every couple of weeks. You know, so that's, that's a really, really good idea. Okay. Again, if you're in the room, just kind of keep an eye on your voice. If you want to have a conversation, just step in the hallway. It does echo in here. And it's a little harder to concentrate, and we have much more time and, and questions. So thank you. Uh, Tim Clancy, Lake Tiger. Well, Steve, I've been here a while. Uh, I came here today because we're concerned about the hat. But prior to the hat, I've been working with the newly elected mayor of Jefferson about trying to do all the stories that were abruptly canceled around 2005. I hold my hand. $300,000 worth of real study that we, we could go forward with sewers. And I don't think the science has changed. At Lake Apaca, where two and a half of the towns are sewered, less than half of the lake is sewered. I didn't hear sewers mentioned once today. And I'm having difficulty when I talk to homeowners sometimes, because I'm trying to promote this. It's my view. I don't think the science has changed. 80% of the phosphorus is coming from septics and stormwater. Yet, Half of my lake is not stored. I know it's difficult, and 
we need real money, serious money, and it's being made more difficult because there's so much happy talk about sector management. I don't have much belief that that is largely beneficial and certainly not as beneficial as sewers. So don't we also need to get the towns that are not stored stored or my waste and my time? If this, this has been eight weeks and I'm doing real hard work and I didn't hear sewers mentioned here once. Yeah. And I think it's possible politically because there's a very good likelihood that an infrastructure package is going to come. If I am not able to work with the community and the elected officials to turn these feasibility studies, and this costs us $300,000 in the mothball, if I'm not able to get the community support and bring this to shovel ready, we might be SOL if infrastructure money becomes available and we're not prepared to get online and say we're ready, let's go. Are stores as important as stormwater? Because that's what all this was about today. Now, one to mention the stores. What's your first name again? Uh, Tim Clancy. So I think Tim brings up one point I just want to mention. It really takes people who are dedicated to push politicians and elected officials. And it's, not, it's really hard. And especially when you're talking about things that cost money in a world where there are five top issues in New Jersey. Taxes, 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 and taxes. And politicians are most worried about those top five issues. And anything that has a cost to it could imperil them for their reelection. And having a community that's calling on them to do something drives them to make change. And so I want to thank you, Tim, for, for the point of your comment. I look at it this way. I know that my home, I like the pack on, has been devalued by this half. Is it 10%? Is it 20 it's a lot. Yeah. There's $1.5 billion worth of real estate on Lake Apacon. If it went down 10%, that's $150 million. Not that the business is lost, the homeowners might be lost. It's a good investment. It's not a tax. It's really a user fee. There's, there's all sorts of complications. Yeah. But yeah, no, I just want to be clear because I'm trying to struggle with members of the community yeah. who say, oh, no, we, we're doing uh, septic management. We don't need sewers. No, we need sewers. And if, the professionals are not going to say, yes, if you can pull that off, that's what we need to do, then it's going to be a way to that problem. Again, the conflict with homeowners, friends of mine, yeah. over 20, 30 years, and they're viewing it as a tax, and they know it's an investment in your home. Correct. This lake got hurt real bad this year. If this comes back next year, with your home value. And the economy and the future ability for the lake to be there for the future. So I'm not the scientist. I would say it's yes and. I think, you know, septics, and sewers have their place in, in part of the solutions, but, it, but it's complicated. So I'll pass it to scientists if they want to add. And I, and I think it's complicated in part and mostly because of the politics, but also the grandfathering nature of, of, of septics, you know. One of the things I could recommend to you is if you can, and you might have it already, I, I don't know specifically what you're holding in your hand, but has, it's, 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 if, if somebody has studied if, if they've looked at what the impact of the existing septics are, and you can point to real uh, issues from the septics, it's an easier sell. No, this, this is actually way beyond that. This is, it is. This is a three hundred thousand dollars study that was brought forth by the previous administration. Probably because it's painful to do, and the new administration is being brave and sticking its head up. If we can't come up with 40, 50 million dollars of federal money, we just have to bring this to shovel ready. This is extraordinarily detailed. I'm saying it was disappointing tonight because unless the science has changed, it's 80 percent from stormwater and septics and they can pack on it, and we're no, they'll be here talking about septics. Well, I can tell you that one of the examples I gave on stormwater utilities was to deal with, with bailing septics. So you can use a stormwater utility to deal with failing septic, at least they have in other states. How the regulations are going to flesh out here, I don't know. But I'm doing a study right now in New Jersey on a situation where there are failing septics and we are sewering the area. And it didn't happen until the public was made aware of the damage that the failing septics was actually doing. Well, well, with that in mind, 80% of the septics in my town of Jefferson, above that, or fail, even if they're brand new based on lot size, soil type, underlying rock, water table, and all these other issues. Septics are failed. They were built for 1920 cottages, and now they're year round. It needs to be done. 
There's probably towns in Iraq that are stored, but I'm not telling you to get it stored. I'm saying please do things when we have these public forums. Say you need to store your lake because if scientists don't believe that's the number one single thing we can do, then it's going to make it much that, that much hard for the hair on fire type conversation in trying to get these things accomplished. But I just want to hear it out loud. Stores. Chris, did you want to add anything? Doctor Bruckner. So not, not really, but I mean, what, what winds up happening is I, I don't know if it's the under, number one problem with your lakes. I haven't read the reports and I haven't studied it, but I can tell you for a fact that uh, source, the source system is going to be much better than the septic systems when we talk about the lake. So it's, it's a no-brainer, right? The other piece of this, though, too, is it, it's also kind of easy to do because we do have this uh, environmental infrastructure trust fund, though, the water bank. Where the town could take a low interest loan to kind of do this, so so it's a mechanism in place to, to, to address this, you know. So all, all you need is design plans to submit to them, and, and then you, know, you get a low interest loan, which is like borrowing money at zero percent, and yeah, you have to pay it back, you know. But um, so that, so that's like a kind of a no brainer to me. I mean, it seems like an easy answer, except I, I know uh, Jefferson's a lot of rock and there's a lot of blasting involved, right? So it, it drives the cost up. But um, I, I really think that that's something you could certainly look at, but. It's hard for us, the panel, I, I haven't read the studies, I don't know if Jim or Steve has, but to understand you know, how much contribution septic versus stormwater runoff and things like that, but it, it's a very simple answer that uh, sewering that community will, will certainly uh, be much better than 80% of it failing septic. So, so that's, a, that's a no brainer. If you have the reports to support that, uh, I'm not sure what the problem is with the town. Well, well Cliff knows very good my question. Our sewage is but by many magnitudes better than septic yeah. maintenance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I didn't hear yeah. it once and it kind of makes my job hard. Yeah. Okay. No, Tim, I, I, I agree with you 100%. And I mean, I did a lot of that modeling that, that identified, you know, the, the relative role of septics versus <laughs> uh, you know, and, and the thing is, I mean, we were talking tonight about lakes in general, okay? And when you look at lakes in general, there's lakes that are sewered, that are experiencing halves, and there are lakes that are on septic that are experiencing halves. And you know, for Lake Patcon, part of the solution is dealing with some of that septic loading over time. And you know, the, the initial approach is yes, we'll do septic management because we know that, that it, it's, it, it's an easier thing to do. It's not as costly. Is it as effective as sewing? No, I'll be the first one to, you know, to agree, agree with that. But I think, you know, overall, I mean, we have to look at each one of these lakes, not uniformly. Each one of them has their own separate problems. And I have lakes that do have, they're on septic, but they're not, that septic's not that's necessarily the, you know, the, the primary factor that's creating problems. So I think in your case, and with a PATCON, yeah, more, you know, there's, there's a lot more that could be done with, with further sewering the watershed. And I'm not gonna, you know, say that's not a good idea. I'd be 100% behind that. Okay. Thank you. And I also want to mention, like, a lot of you who are still here, I just want to say, Tim needs your help. Our organization needs your help. Anjac and Highlands Coalition, um, we need your help to move, I mean, you know, the elected officials and key decision makers to take these steps that may be a little uncomfortable for them when they think about their next election. And so if you're interested in getting involved in that work, please see one of us, see me, um, because it takes that constant buzzing to move the needle on you know, what is uh, a really important step to protect our natural resource. And they're, you know, these folks are in powers of, uh, positions of power and make decisions and um, stymie progress, unfortunately. Um, if, you know, it's unpopular for some reason. So, yeah. Using history as a guide, back in the 60s when there was a failing septic system, people used phosphate tent, phosphate in the surgeon, phosphate in the fertilizer, and we didn't have algae blooms. Um, with the illumination of the phosphate from the uh, fertilizer, and obviously people not using phosphate in the detergents, the, the ground runoff was the same today as it was. Uh, way back when because the atmosphere is the same. Um, will we see a reduction in the nanograms of, uh, of phosphates in the lake, assuming that uh, it's not using fertilizer? That would be the biggest uh, 
input at this point for the sun regulated. Assuming the septic system, you know, people don't want the smell from the septic system, they'll fix it. So. Yeah, I mean, I think what we heard was phosphorus is not allowed in fertilizers. Yeah. It is regulated in New Jersey. So fertilizer, take that out of your mind. That's not the issue. It's development. It's concrete. It's pavement. It's housing. It's streets. It's strip malls. It's parking lots. It's everything that isn't natural, untouched land. That's what's contributing. And that's very different than when I grew up here in, in in utilizing the lake. There, those of you who've been around for a generation or more, there's a lot more stuff around our lakes than there was. And that's the factor that's you changed. Think that, how did you know, it, it dwarf the amount of, uh, of uh, phosphate being put in? When it was, yeah, like from dishwasher detergent and stuff. Yeah. It's and, 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 the, and the fertilizer? Not, yeah, yeah the, there's, there's okay. not the fertilizer. Yeah. Yeah. So when I prepare my literature email blast flyer to send out in my local community, I'll include new rain gardens and aerating lawns and perhaps switching, you know, the part of your lawn towards the lake to the ground cover. Um, now I know a lot of people tell us that you know, it's, it's too rocky to build a rain garden. So what other suggestions can I make? Does it make sense for me to, to uh, encourage people not to totally cut down the, uh, the growth along the shoreline, the poles that grow, maybe cut them only to a foot high, to, to leave some of that to filter, is that sound advice? Are you finding now people are asking that question more, given everything that's happening, or is it just oh, no, general? It's, it's just me trying to suggest solutions. Awesome, thank you. Chris? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so I, if, if it's too rocky for a rain garden and, and you can't build one, although we just built one in Pack on it, the uh, senior center uh, the other day. Um, but if it's too rocky to do that, certainly having a vegetative buffer along the shoreline, uh, something that's too, even just a few feet wide to filter out what's running off from the lawn is great. Uh, you know, using native plants and things like that. I wouldn't suggest putting in Japanese uh, red maple or knotweed or things that are invasive, you know, but, but trying to try to use native plants. And, and you can still have a path to the waterway. So, so one thing we typically do is we will put a 10 or 15 foot buffer along, along a lake and then we'll meander a path in, you know, so that if geese are in the lake, they won't see the grass and then walk out the grass. So, so that's always a, a great thing to do. And it can look very beautiful. I mean, we use a lot of irises and cardinal flowers. So, so that stuff can be really gorgeous. So, so I would certainly recommend that. There's a lot of information that Rutgers can provide you about, you know, what to plant in that buffer. And certainly contact us and we'll be able to give you a whole list of plants that can go there. And, and where to get them. So, okay. That would be helpful. Yeah, sure. We're here, we're here to help. You know. Specific plant, something that's out there, you know, and spaces yeah. like. Um, is, is gravel an effective filter at all? Like, if you've got. Not really. I mean, you know, uh, vegetation is a much nicer filter than gravel. I mean, uh, if you have a gravel edge to your property and it's designed so the water can go into that and seep into the ground and filter the ground, it might be okay, but. Um, really, the vegetation is what's going to filter out because the roots will take up the nutrients uh, and it will also filter out the stuff as it passes over the lawn. So that's always the best answer. Okay. Thank you. And you have to be careful with the gravel too because it can compact just, you know, they come like concrete depending on the size. Again, thank you for this evening. Uh, you. My name is Phil Riley. Uh, just for reference, I'm the owner of a company called Watermark Technologies. I used to work for General Chemical. And I ran the water treatment division and have extensive experience in treating lakes. Um, my question is when you look at Lake Apacon, it's not one lake, it's really five different separate bodies of water that each one functions in and of itself, like Byron Cove, Henderson Cove, worth of Brady Street, River Stixon as a main part of the body water. I'm wondering, and I know I've done it, and I know you have done it already. You've treated a number of lakes with what they call neutralized alum. The function of neutralized alum is it clarifies the phosphate in the water column, and then it also seals, depending upon the treatment level, it seals the phosphate in the mud at the bottom of the lake. Yes, runoff is a major problem, and it's going to come back again. But it's taking years for this lake to get to the point that it is today. So the phosphate levels are 0 0.045, 0 0.05, at really high levels. My recommendation, if 
if it's at all possible, is that we do a pilot study on one of the five, one of the four bodies of water that lead into Lake Opaqua. And we do that study, and the problem is we've got to start working on that study today. Because you've got to get soil samples, water column samples, and the best time to treat that lake is next April. Now, you mentioned that Lake Opac Lake Mohawk is doing a very good job this year, a lot better than many other lakes. Lake Mohawk did, if I remember correctly, your company did an alum treatment on Lake Mohawk. So we know that it works. And the cost is the cost is high. For about a hundred acre, a hundred acres of land is going to cost about two hundred thousand dollars to treat that one section. And I think we should try to set up and do a test on one of those four bodies, not the main body. It's too deep. You don't need to worry about that main body. If you could treat those four sub four bodies of water that flow into the main part of the lake, you could probably clean this lake up next summer and never have this happen again for about three or four years. It's going to come back. And your your whole uh, presentation about lake water management and runoff and everything is critical. But what we want to have a nice lake next year. We've got to do something now. What you're talking about is not going to help us next summer if this same, same thing happens. But if we do a thought to do a, a neutralized alum treatment, we will have a chance to correct the problem, minimize it, so we have time to get the rest of it going. Yeah, I think my understanding is here at Lake Mohawk, there's like basins where that's happening. So go ahead. No, I wasn't going to answer the question. <laughs> Yeah, I, in, you know, I've been one of the biggest proponents in the state of using alum as a means of managing phosphorus levels in lakes. This lake was treated with alum twice, surface application, but there's a continuous dosing system that introduces alum in very low concentrations into the lake on a daily basis. That's at the, run at the runoff spots where the water is coming in from the runoff. Spots. Nope, it's throughout the entire lake. There's oh, really? miles and miles of pipeline oh, wow. that run through the bottom of this lake. Okay, it's a very unique system. All right, um, there's another system like this at at at, at uh, 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 what metal lake? Bottom line is that not every lake is suitable for alum treatment. You know that. There are certain things about alum that, that create water quality problems. I'm not going to argue know with anything to create alum creates. What's that? I don't know any situation where neutralized alum creates a water problem. I'll talk to you about it later. But yeah, well, I've treated about 15 or 20 lakes with neutralized alum and never had a problem. Yeah, the problem is most when most lakes are treated with alum, it's not using some type of, of augmented alum. They're just using straight alum, and as a result of that, you can, you know, as you know, you can you can crash the, the pH and cause problems. That's why I said neutralize. Right. Now, yeah, I understand. I mean, that's very specific. So just what I said. just to get back to your question, I do think that uh, that would probably be something that that would be suitable to investigate for Lake Pacha. And I know Dr. Fred Lovell has you know has looked at that. So I think you know what you're saying is you know has a lot of merit and it should be something that's evaluated. But at the same time, you know, even at this lake, there's a lot of other measures that are being implemented to minimize algae blooms. There's an aeration system, there's an extensive amount of work that's been done by the community and by the town of Spotter and by the, the county in stormwater management around the lake. So these are all things that are being used in, in concert. And this lake does septic management as well. So all of those things add up. But you know, for Lake Papcon, yeah, I don't I I would say, you know, take a look at that, uh, you know, in terms of using alum, as you're saying, in a, in maybe like a, a a test case type of scenario. Well you've got those you've got those four completely different bodies of water. Yeah. Take river sticks and treat river sticks and see what happens. Or take Henderson Cove and treat Henderson Cove and watch it and see what happens. Right, I think and Henderson, Henderson Cove and Byron Cove would probably be better candidates. And I, I would love it because I live on Byron right. Cove, so let's do it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think it's something that we need to do to get this thing over with right. so we have a clean lake next year. Thank you. Okay. About five minutes left, two questions left. Thank you to our diehards. Go ahead. Hey, good evening, I'm Mike Sanzillis, the mayor from Mount Arlington, and I want to just thank you guys so much for what you're doing. Um, we met earlier in the season, long before there was a HAB, 
and I uh, created a green uh, infrastructure not in May. I want to thank you for that. Uh, thank you. We started the Green Infrastructure Committee and Stormwater Management Committee. Uh, I have a request for you guys, though, and that is, let's say next summer, we're back to Kumbaya and everything is gone and the Habs are gone. We need to keep the conversation going and I'd like you to do what you're doing now, whether or not there's a Hab next year or not. Keep the conversation, conversation going. Absolutely. Uh, that's very important. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask you also to talk about working together. Okay, so as leaders, we're all leaders and we're all leaders, we uh, should be working together, not against each other, and, and uh, no disrespect to League Conservation Voters, but I'm constantly hearing you say things about politicians that are stump the politician or, you know, things that are just putting us at odds with each other. And I would really like you to come to my office, and I'm offering you that invitation right now for everybody to sit down with me and my green infrastructure team and talk about what ideas we have. The four mayors have gotten together with our administrators numerous times in the last couple of months. We're going to continue that practice. I'd like you to be part of it. Happy to do it. One politician or another. I'm on my school board, so I'm happy. All right, so yeah, I'm happy to. Uh, to I do can that. see a small uh, bullseye on your back. So it's a little board's tough. Let me tell you. Yeah, <laughs> I, you know, we do need to work together on this, and there's a lot of opportunities for us to get solutions. Also, the septic. I do know that uh, some of the other, you know, Mountain were fully sewered on the way. We need to focus on where we can help the other towns. So we're working yeah. outside of our little silos. We're opening our doors to each other and finding ways where we can totally work together. And, uh, and your, some of your ideas have been outstanding. So thank you so much. Thank you. Let's work Appreciate together, it. okay? Absolutely. Thanks again.